Listen, man, it's an absolute pleasure for me to have you on this podcast for so many reasons. We got a chance to talk a little bit in the beginning, but right before we get into it, I just want to tell everybody it's an honor for me to have Tah- uh, Thabit Al-Tahir on this podcast because of the reason that I feel like we're on the verge of a very special time in the Middle East in terms of jujitsu. And Thabit is one of those people that opened up my eyes to this and gets me excited to think of what's possible. So thank you so much for taking the time of being on this podcast with me. You're most welcome, man. You know, the pleasure and honor is all mine. I mean, this is a great opportunity for me and, uh, you know, a great opportunity to meet somebody that's done so much already for the region. I appreciate you, man. I appreciate you saying that. Listen, I know this is a, an interesting time. It's Ramadan. It's Corona pandemic time. It, it, tell me, how are, you, how are you doing these days? What are you up to? Are you like family time in Ramadan? Are you busy with the, the business still? Man, just like you said, it's, it's a truly, truly interesting time. I mean, Ramadan has always been very special for me, you know, just, you know, as, as uh, Arabs and Muslims growing up in, uh, I grew up in Jordan, so we always had a bit of a family feel to Ramadan. Everybody got together. Uh, if it's not the, you know, the extended family, just the close-knit family, we all got together every day for Rafal. So, you know, that sense of it is a little bit, a little bit off because we're not doing right. that, you know, so much. We're going to see my parents. Nice. We're not okay. seeing anybody else really. Um, and still like we're going home and we're not like hugging and kissing. So it's a little bit weird, um, yeah. but you know, it's, it's Ramadan nonetheless. It's a, it's a blessed spiritual time nonetheless. And, you know, we're using that, you know, to the best of our abilities to be, you know, the best people, you know, personally, the best person I can be mentally, physically, I like spiritually, that. emotionally. I like it. Man, isn't it crazy that we got to a point so quickly where we're even scared to hug family out of protecting it's them? Fun, yeah. Yeah. I, f- I feel like we're living in a movie, man. It's just, I- I'm happy Dubai lifted that permit that they had going. So at least you can go see your yeah, parents, right? Oof, man, I hadn't seen them for a month before that happened. Oh, and we man. live in Dubai. Both of us. That's crazy. That's crazy. D- did you, um, so basically Dubai went through two weeks of um, lockdown and you had to get a permit just to leave the house, right? Correct. So, I mean, we have a, we have a spinnies right across the street from uh-huh. our building. And, uh, you know, uh, law says you need to get a permit to even do that. Right. Um, so I, I didn't mind. I mean, I filed in for a permit online. It took a few minutes, but, Perfect. um, and, and I, I appreciate that. I appreciate that. Trying to keep tabs on, on this kind of thing. Yeah. Um, but you know, it's, it, it truly feels like a movie. It feels like that 12 monkeys movie. I don't know if you've seen that. Yeah, man, absolutely. Uh, absolutely. It, it feels like <laughs> Man, that's, that's the crazy thing. I was, I was talking to my family just now. Al Iftar. We're basically saying yeah. that our reference to these crazy times is non-existent. Most of us, like this generation that's alive right now, right. doesn't have a reference for a crazy pandemic time. So our only reference is movies, 12 Monkeys, the epidemic movies. Right. So how we react might be based off of these movies as well. <laughs> Absolutely, man. Absolutely. I and mean, you know, everything, even in the past, like everything would shift in Ramadan. You know, like most things happen during the day. You know, some things still have to happen during the day. Um, but then, you know, our, like my personal lifestyle, you know, I like to continue to be active and athletic and, you know, take care of right. myself so I don't fall uh, right. real back behind. So uh, things shift a little bit, uh, but it's still there. Still there. It's just about managing your time and nutrition and sleep effectively. I like, I like how you say that already right off the bat. Listen, it's, we talked on Instagram. We never spoke in person. Am I right? Nope. This is the first time we nope, literally never. talked to each other. But listen, yep. there's some, some people that you know, you, you just... You get this third, third eye instinct and you know you're going to yeah. click with them and you know that you, you're going to vibe. And you're one of those people. And just hearing you say this is the reason I called you Thabit, the inspiration of Tahir. <laughs> All right. I'm, I'm flattered. <laughs> you, you, you have a nice way of looking at things. I've watched. Uh, I'll tell you, see, honestly, I stalked you a little bit on your entropy. I, I, I checked out your social media profile because yeah. it's interesting. I look at social media like a boiling pot. Right, you got water in a boiling pot. Everybody is yep. a water molecule in this pot. And some of them are in the bottom. Nothing wrong with that. You need water yep. in the bottom to reach the top. But as it gets yep. hot, it reaches the surface. And that's when you really start seeing the bubbles and the popping and the steam. I feel like you started popping up on my social media without me looking for you because close friends of mine, <laughs> people in the jiu-jitsu community, uh, started like sharing, resharing what you were doing. And that was around the entropy time. That's when you yep. got on the radar big time for me. Love so, it, the entropy time. That's, yeah. it. That's how it is for me, you know, in my head as well. That's what I call it. <laughs> the entropy era. <laughs> yeah, well, the era, yeah, exactly. And, and the video that first captured my attention and made me yeah, like... Yeah, tell me, I, what was it? I need to talk to you is the, you can become anything in 10 years. Why not be a black belt? Man, man. 
Man, was, this this uh, echoed like wh when I heard it. Psh, I, I'm like, baby, baby, I called my wife. Come here, sit down, listen to this shit. <laughs> and, and, and I made her sit down. I made her listen to this because it wasn't about jujitsu. Because my wife was was at that time talking to me just the night before. I don't know what to do. I don't know what to pick up. I want to pick up something. I want to do something, but. You know, uh, I, I don't know if I'll be good or not. And I'm like, listen to this video. It's perspective. It's time. Don't look at it as yeah. tomorrow. Ten years. Set that long goal. And you can be anything. You can be a writer, a black belt, a PhD. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. I yeah. love that Absolutely, mindset man. from you. So, like, I, mean, you I have, definitely... You have to play I, the long game. Yeah. 100%. And I definitely want to get into that mindset uh, talk with you because uh, this is part of uh, why I feel a lot of people should... Uh, be tuning into your jiu-jitsu profile, your entropy profile, and to you personally, because there's a lot of good that can come out of it. And I'm excited to see the future in it. So, man, absolutely my pleasure. I want to find out about Fabit. Since we never really met before, and I didn't get a chance to find out about your past for many people, what got yep. you into this world? Like, into, you grew up in Jordan, you said? Yeah, that's right. Born and raised until Born the raised. age of uh, 17. Right around college, university time, that's when I, you know, started to actually travel and go abroad. So and and before that, abroad. were you like an athletic guy? Were you somebody into sports or? Man, like I'll tell you one thing, like I was uh, up to the time when I started jujitsu. I mean, I, I always loved sports, but I, mm. I wasn't what you would call like made, uh, you know, made to be uh, athletic. I was a very, very, very skinny kid. Mm -hmm. Like I loved sports. I loved running around. I did the, I played the soccer basketball, volleyball, uh, all the stuff that they make you do in PE, like make you do in, <laughs> nice. uh, PE okay. in, in school. And then, um, but nothing like really chimed, so mm. to speak, right? For me, it was just like something that, I, oh, I enjoy doing. I enjoy doing with other people, whether it's uh, classmates or, um, you know, after school, we go back home and play in the street, play football in the street. So right. soccer in the street. I don't I like to call it football. I don't like the whole soccer thing. Yeah, me too. Um, <laughs> let's put it out there. Um, <laughs> I like I, until like until I started jujitsu, I right. was not what you would like. You look at me and you see like, oh, it's some very skinny dude. And mm -hmm. um, you know, my parents, you know, me growing up, they were always uh, a little bit worried, as Arab mm -hmm. parents do, about their right. kids. And they always wanted to get me, you know, ready, so like ready for life. And so I got pushed into so many things, like you name it. If you can name an old martial art that was, oh, you know, okay. being taught in schools and dojos in Jordan, like I tried it. I tried nice. taekwondo, karate. Um, you, you name it, everything. And but none of it like really stuck. Like I'd stay there for a month, two mm -hmm. months, you know, maximum uh, three months. And then it, it just, it wouldn't chime with it. Like it, it you just wouldn't connect just wouldn't with go. it. No, no, I wouldn't connect with it, not on any mm -hmm. level. And it just sort of started to feel like an obligation mm -hmm. to go more than something that I enjoyed. And Got so you. I just kept on going to my parents, like, no, no that's a, I'm, I'm not going anymore. I'm not going anymore. And then, right. you know, one day out of the blue, uh, it was my mom, I think. Uh, yeah, it was my mom. She came to me. She's like, hey, there's this new martial art that's being taught in town. Uh, it's really amazing. I've heard so many good things about it. You really have to try it. I'm like, I made that, that face like, oh, okay. She goes, you know what? You uh, just try this once. And if you don't wow. like it, I'll never push you to do anything ever again. And that was my the first time that I ever tried jujitsu. And, you know, uh, I'd love to tell you that the rest is history, but there's so much that happened there. But that's I'm like sure. the day that I got addicted. Literally, I got addicted. Everything started wow. to revolve around me getting to class. At, what is it? It was kids class. So it was like 5 p.m. at that time. How old were you? I was 14. Man, Allah khali mama. That's a very, <laughs> vision, <laughs> that's very visionary, bro. That's crazy. Exactly. Yeah, it's uh, well. I don't know. I, I don't know how much of a visionary it is because at some point when I started to get really, really into it and going into tournaments, she started kind of like, oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> but, <laughs> um, I, I do. I, I thank. I thank the. Uh, thank God every day for. Uh, what that day. What got her exposed to jujitsu? Like, how did she hear about it? Because you're talking about when was this? What year? This was 2003. 2003. I didn't even know about jujitsu back then. Like, I barely heard about Very. it. Very few people did. And actually, you know, um, you know, and I went just to give you like a, a, a sort of like a point of reference. Uh, mm -hmm. The highest level belt was a purple belt at the time. In Jordan. It, right. Man, underground mama. Okay, cool. It, it, seriously. And so like, um, uh, here's, here's how I, to, to the best of my memory, I guess it happened. Uh, my mom had like a, a bit of a back problem. I forget, mm -hmm. I forget why, but she had to like, she had to see like a, a bunch of people for physiotherapy and rehab. Um, right. And one of them was a, was a chiropractor. He's one of the 
one of the absolute best people in the world, like as a human and as a chiropractor. His name is uh, Tariq Kalimat. I don't know if you've mm-hmm. heard of him. I haven't, no. So, so Tariq Kalimat, um, he's a, he's a kickboxer. He mm-hmm. practices jujitsu, practices jujitsu in the States and uh, oh, got his okay. chiropractic degree in the States, came back wow. to, uh, came back to Jordan and opened up his practice like in his house, literally had a clinic in his house. Uh-huh. And he would only see like a select few uh, people like from references. And uh, somehow like my mom got referred to him and he's the one who told her like, hey, you have kids, right? And he's the one who was running that dojo at the time. Fascinating. Okay. And where was this? In Jordan, he had his dojo in Amman? Yeah, it was in, uh, I don't know how familiar you are with Amman, but it was in bit. Arabia. Okay, very cool. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. And, and so you're young, you're a kid, you go to your first class. Uh, just off the top of your head, if you can remember, what was your connection to it? Did you like it? Did you feel it was weird? Man, like, I, I don't even have to go top of my head. I remember it like it was yesterday. Wow, I mean, okay. for me, it just felt like the, the wrestling that I do with my brothers at home, mm-hmm. that was that, was what, that they did in class. I'm like, oh, that's what you do in class? Amazing. Oh. And you can teach me how to be good at it? Come on, let's go. <laughs> I love it, man. And that's the thing. Like, a lot of people don't understand why kids connect so quickly with jiu-jitsu versus other sports. And it's because it's just their natural state of play. It's not really complicated. <laughs> no, 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 not really. Especially if you have brothers. So I'm the oldest mm. of four brothers. Um, oh, so wow. Okay, my I always Allah. play wrestle with my brothers at home. Okay. Um, You're so the oldest me, by how, how much? Three, three years, three and a half years. So you got some advantage on you. <laughs> some advantage. Some, well, when, they, when they got older, it was like, oh, okay, I need to do jujitsu ah, now. I can't do <laughs> Man, nature does that to you, man. Uh, you, you bully them, bully them, and then one of them just gets this shot of testosterone. <laughs> you're like, shit, <laughs> maybe I shouldn't have. <laughs> it, bigger, taller, and you're like, oh, good. Uh, that, that's what I love about stories of brothers, where the older brother used to kick the younger brother's ass, but the younger brother got into jujitsu. And then the older brother's like, oh, <laughs> man, I'm too busy working. I can't train and all this. And their, their younger brother is like a purple belt, brown belt. Now I can't touch him. <laughs> well, funny enough, like when, when we when I started, I was like, say we, because my me and my brother, Saleh, we mm-hmm. started uh, jujitsu together. So we, oh. we went in there and we were in the same class for, for about a year. And, um, you know, what happened to him is what used to happen to me, you know, back when I used to try other martial arts is this, he fell out of it. Didn't really okay. feel the a strong connection to it, I guess. And he felt like more obliged to go rather than uh, enjoyment, let's say. So he just sort of tapered off on the side. Okay. And then uh, my other brother, Faisal, he started jujitsu uh, sometime later, not in the same even school as me. It was around the time that, um, that uh, Sami Jaman started his, uh, his practice of teaching in Jordan. And okay. he you know, started training with, uh, with his team at the time. And mm. then it was like a, a short amount of time and he also he also tapered off and and then See. there's uh hassan my fourth my third brother we're, we're four okay. and um he's he tried it, it as first well time he but but hassan the youngest the first time he ever tried it was uh was with me actually at uh at entropy wow okay and how's he liking so, that experience well he likes it he loves it a lot um i did i guess it's just a, for him of just um continuously showing up like being consistent with it and that's true um that's that's a, that's a big part of it you know like some days they feel great and some days they're like not so much they just have to stick with it and right. uh, and see where it goes that's what, that's where the whole like 10 year thing comes in it doesn't even have to be that um but you know he likes it he likes being there but i guess um not enough to show up every day every day every day i get you that's the thing you. that's what i find interesting with kids is as an adult you've gone through a lot of experience in life and you figure it out that you need to keep persevering and keep pushing through the downfalls and things to get really good at something. Kids don't uh-huh. know that lesson yet. So when they first right. hit that wall with jujitsu, you feel like that's the first dropping off point, right? Right. So absolutely. As a kid, did you experience that yourself? I can't say that I did. I I, nice. I just don't know. Like uh, it's it's like these days. I well not these days, but before Corona, I, yeah. I go in and I teach you. Uh, class, kids, adults, everything. And I'd mm. see how different people who are new to jujitsu react to it mm. when they come to the mats for the first time, when they step into class, um, every sort of bit of it. And I kind of try to think back to my mindset and what I experienced way back when. Sure. And I, I guess it's like you said, for some people, it's just different. For some people, they just, or some kids, they just have this shock of what's going mm. on here. Mm-hmm. And others, they just feel like they belong. And I always felt like 
you know, I belonged from day one. It wasn't wow. like I needed to come back to see what it was about. It was like, okay, when's the next practice? I love it. I love it. So that, that also says a lot about your coach. He must have made it interesting enough for you to feel that. Yep. Uh, Zaid Mirza was uh, the first person that uh, taught me jujitsu. So he was that purple belt in Jordan. Oh, uh, wow. He was my first teacher. And, you know, uh, one of my absolute favorite people. I, I love Zaid uh, to death. He taught me so much about, you know, about jujitsu, about life. Um, yeah, that was, you know, pivotal time in my life as well. You know, being a teenager always is. But, uh, you know, it was during that time where, you know, I had a you know, coach, a mentor, you know, on the right. mats. I talked to him. You know, sometimes Very important. Mats, and mm. it's, you know, extremely. And, uh, you know, I'm forever grateful, you know, not just for making it to the mats, but, uh, sure. but to Zaid for sharing his passion and, uh, and his guidance for all, those, uh, all that time. Incredible, man. I, I've always heard such good things about Zaid Mirza. And everything that you're saying resonates with me because that's kind of the whole concept of this podcast. The Brazilians call it Hezenia. Uh, we call it mm -hmm. just post-rolling talk, you know. These are the uh -huh. times where you get almost 50% of the value of jujitsu because you train, you get the endorphins running, you get all those feel good feelings going, stress out, you sit on the mat and that's when the beautiful conversations happen and the life lessons happen for jujitsu, right? Absolutely. Uh, Absolutely. This, this podcast environment, I hope to mimic that, to get to a point where I feel like I can get that wisdom from you, right? And from the people that I interview so that we can share that with everybody and make us feel more connected as a community rather than different clubs, different gyms. End of the day, we all practice the same sport. We sweat the same. We have the same problems. Learning from each other, it's a, it's a rising tide. It raises all boats, right? Absolutely. It's one of my favorite quotes, man. See, I'm, I like I'm really it. connected somehow. I tell you, bro, you get this feeling, you get the sixth sense and it works out. Alhamdulillah, man. I'm happy that we can uh, get to that level of comfort so quickly in a podcast because I feel like everybody's going to gain so much value off that. For me, uh, Thabit, I wanted to talk to you about something as well. When it comes to Middle Shalma. East martial arts, you are mm -hmm. very closely connected to almost the foundation of jiu-jitsu in Jordan. Your coach, Zaid Mirza, was a purple belt. It's not like you went in, you got a black belt, five stripes teaching the class. It was just mm -hmm. really surfacing in Jordan, jiu-jitsu. It was primitive. I feel... And correct me if I'm wrong, with martial mm -hmm. arts like jujitsu, it takes mm -hmm. a special kind of person to click with it as an adult. Forget kids for a second. As yeah. an adult, in order for you to like jujitsu, you got to be a little bit on the modern side, a little bit open minded to grapple and hug with somebody on the ground, right? Yep, yep. And in a community and a culture like Jordan's, that's pioneering, mm -hmm. right? Yep, yep. I love the, the value it brings, and I love to see how I feel jiu-jitsu played a huge role in sports and combat of Jordan. Because boxing, karate, taekwondo, judo, all of these existed in Jordan way before jiu-jitsu, right? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, as national sports, too. Yeah, but today you see Jordan really on top of the MMA game. And the fighters are not, well, uh, you know, sorry, but we, we have that cliche... Uh, Let's say people have this cliche stereotype of Jordanians or Palestinians or this region of being tough and all muscle, no brain kind of thing. <laughs> and they couldn't be farther from the truth today because I feel yeah. jujitsu played a huge role in, in making that fight IQ really high in Jordan, right? Absolutely, man. Absolutely. I can tell you firsthand uh, uh -huh. because a lot of the people that, that now, uh, mashallah, they're really successful. They have their own academies and they compete at the international level. A lot of those guys, we would share the mats at white belt, green belt, you know, like those days Crazy. when we were all kids. Mm. And, and, and I can tell you that for sure. Like I knew these people growing up and, mm -hmm. you know, I, we, we kept in touch like throughout the years. And right. I can tell you that jujitsu had an, a huge, huge significant impact on their lives mm -hmm. and ergo on the lives of everybody else involved. Right. So each of them went into kind of their own way, spread their own wings uh, in a way and started teaching yeah. and spreading and not just jujitsu, but just like you said, that intelligent mentality of, mm -hmm. you know, this new age, um, not just of how to think about sports, but how to think about really anything. Yes. Yes. I mean, the beauty of, uh, of jujitsu as a, as a martial art is it's very technical based, which means you need to seek knowledge. In order to seek knowledge, you have to look out. You cannot stay close minded. You cannot be like, no, I'm only going to do this and I believe in this. You're going to get your ass kicked eventually. So you have to stay open. That openness is so magical in jujitsu. It makes people open to talking to cultures, different people, different backgrounds. It breaks down so many barriers, right? I think that's kind of why the UAE adopted it so strongly. Well, um, I'd like to think that, I mean, mm. uh, if that's the reason, then mm. hallelujah, that's great. You know, the ability or the, let's say the, the openness to be uh, coachable, to be teachable, 
Yes. You know, that idea, that concept of the ability for you to learn from somebody else Absolutely. Okay, that maybe does the same thing, maybe does it differently, maybe does something completely different, but just that openness, you know, that, that, that says everything, that changes everything. Absolutely. Uh, t- tell me something, uh, Zaid Mirza yeah. and, and the guys that started out jiu-jitsu in Jordan, did they have a root or connection to the U.S. or Brazil? They did, they did. Um, so uh, Zaid Mirza's uh, professor or his mm-hmm. teacher, his name is uh, Cassio Wernick. Okay. Uh, I don't know if you've heard the name before, but Cassio Wernick is one of the, you know, the OGs, uh, mm-hmm. I guess, of jiu-jitsu. And I only found out about this because... You know, because of him like telling us about his uh, his teacher, he brought him to Jordan. Um, nice. I think he came twice. Uh, mm-hmm. He met the team. You know, taught class for a little bit, and I, I think he went and taught the army at the time for okay. you know so for uh, you know for a certain period of time. Um, but then you know he's one of those people that really embodies that old school you know jujitsu people coming from the OGs, and he has a school in Sacramento, California. Okay, and. Uh, you know, he's really he's like maybe uh, two or Cassius two or three levels away from you know, I don't know Osvaldo Alves who's like a, who's one of the few red belts in the world. Wow, yeah. Um, so I guess you can say like it, it, it's not that far of a connection even. Exactly, um, exactly, you know? and 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 that's the cool thing because you feel that the Jordanian culture of jiu-jitsu was directly linked with guys who studied in the States, brought that culture to Jordan, and then they have a kids class. Maybe like how big was the kids class back then? You and how many kids? Oh man, maybe like, maybe eight, ten man. max. And that's crazy. It it must feel <laughs> nice to, to, to like, like whether call it fate, call it luck, call it destiny, but it's amazing how just life puts you in a direction whether or not you're part of the, the process, right? Life has a direction for you, and you might not Absolutely. not necessarily know the direction. It's it's just gonna happen. And you attending that class because your mother's back hurt landed you in a class with a guy that's been to the U.S. That's exp- that's part of that lineage, right? Opened your right. mind to these possibilities and influenced you for how many years until you graduated? <laughs> you know? Oh man, until this current, you know, until this current day, it still does. So um, a little uh, a little tweet there. So I think um, you know uh, this information is like not very clear to many people. So Zaid yeah. actually lived in Brazil for a huge part of his uh, life. Oh. And he was there for, I'm not sure how many years, but I'm going to go out on a limb here and say like 14 or 15 before he went back to Jordan. So I, his, his father was, um, uh, was an ambassador. I didn't know this. Um, if, I'm not, if I'm not mistaken, right. And he like would like, you know, move all over the place. And it was a good like decade or more where he lived in Brazil uh, mm-hmm. up until the point where he got his purple belt, of course, learning from, uh, from Castro. That was, I think, before the school in, in, in the U.S. even started. So it's direct, actually, from yeah. Brazil, not even like U- Brazil, U.S., Jordan, or Brazil, Jordan. See, I and see. he's Jordanian. So he's not like it, he was a Jordan. He's a Jordanian. And but he has that Brazilian culture, like, you know, heavily, heavily influenced, influenced by uh, Brazilian culture, obviously fluent in Portuguese. Obviously, he knows his. He has his own network of Brazilians, jiu-jitsu and non-jiu-jitsu. Sure, of course. So, so we got, we kind of got the the mix of both worlds there without even knowing it. Even better, man. Even better. That and that just adds yep. to it. It just adds to that snowball that builds in. And again, like as a kid, I'm sure you weren't probably actively thinking that all of this is impacting you. But now looking back, do you feel yeah. that all of these variables led you down that path in your life? Maybe. Absolutely, man. Like you know, I'm a firm believer that. You are where you are today, uh, mm-hmm. not only because of uh, the decisions you make, but you know the, the things that happen to you along the way. You know some things, right. and this is like partly uh, rooted in us by our religion. You know some things uh, happen to you, okay? mm-hmm. and there are some things that you make a choice, yes. and you know that you influence kind of where that you know where that ripple goes or where that snowball effect goes, yes. wherever you, or wherever yes. it have you. You know, I, and that's why I don't. I don't believe in, you know, one of the things that you, that you mentioned is, you know, it could be uh, destiny, it could be luck. Like, I'm, I'm not one of those uh, luck people. You know, yeah. I, I don't believe in luck. I believe in life by design. And it's like not it. necessarily by you. It could mm-hmm. be, you could influence the design of your own life, you sure. know, but I believe in life by design uh, mm-hmm. by our creator. And, you yeah. know, the decisions along you, the way of your life, you know, take you one direction or another. Like that mentality. And, and a lot of people need to, learn to adopt that to an extent because some people rely too much on fate versus like some people don't believe in fate, right? They, I'm going to 100% craft my own life. And there's a saying right. that I love is, uh, it's in German, right? Uh, it's uh, translated, man plans and God laughs, 
right? Yep, there you go. So, so you've got the guy that tries to plan his life out and then God laughs and changes it for him and vice versa. I like to see it not as binary, as levels. You have exactly. certain things that require your involvement. Like, for yes. example, if you want to feel the rain, you got to step outside, right? Absolutely. If you, if you never step outside, then maybe fate is going to give you a reason to step outside, like some injury and you're going to have to get to the car, right? But these are far and wide apart. So a lot of people, when it comes to things like martial arts, changing their life, their habits, their fitness, kids taking on a martial art, there has to be, you have to go out into the rain every now and then. You have yep. to go try, you have to get 100%. wet. Maybe you don't like it, get back home, right? But you got to go exactly. help God out in that situation, try. you know? You'll never know if you don't try. Exactly, absolutely, man. And I'm so happy like to hear how all the things fell together in your experience. And looking back now, the mentality around jujitsu in Jordan back then versus today, do you think that there's been a drastic shift in, in who does jujitsu, who gets exposed to it? Oh yeah, for sure. I mean, you know, back then it wasn't even something that a lot of people even knew about. You know, you tell someone in the street or your friends or school, like, Oh, I'm going to jujitsu class tonight. And they look at you like you have to do this. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. Literally. And uh, like, what now you're doing? What did you just curse at me? Like, no, no, man, this is jujitsu. Um, uh, but then you go to, from that to now. Um, and obviously like something that's new like that, and it's a sport and it's, you know, taught in, in Jordan in like the early two thousands. Um, right. there were no, there, there were no women in classes, not even exactly. like uh, young Sorry. girls, you know? And you go from that to now having not only like classes packed full of uh, women, which I'm really happy to see on a daily basis. Yes. Um, but you have, you have, you know, female black belts, not, not just people who are amazing gangsters. at what they do and, yes. and their teachers and exactly gangsters. You have people that go out there and win world championships. Mm -hmm. Like it, it's, it's, it's unbelievable. And it's something like, you know, truly uh, inspirational, you know, for me to see it like cross those barriers. Cause it's a huge cultural barrier for us. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's not, it's not a, I don't think it's a bad thing to say or a wrong thing to say. It's just how things were in the past. Yes. It's just that this was more of a male centered sport. Like even yes. in the world championships in Brazil, like in everything, you wouldn't mm. see like uh, too many women. And even now, in the beginning in Brazil. Uh, yes. Right. Exactly. And mm. look at, look at things now. So for sure, the mentality changed from the people practicing it, the people yeah. teaching it and the community surrounding mm. them. So now you walk around Jordan, you say jujitsu and the people go like, oh, but which academy, which yes. teacher? Oh, I love oh, it. goodness. When did this happen? Seriously, so, that must that must amazing. have tripped you out. Do you, do you remember that shift, that time period where it really shifted? Yeah, I mean, it was uh, if, if I if I dare say, like it was almost around the time that I um, that I left for university. So you're think you're talking like 2007, 2008, when nice. I started to go around places and I would see advertisements for jujitsu schools, like in barber shops. Crazy. And I was like, unreal, man, unreal. <laughs> Even though at the time there was just yeah. two schools, and then the third three or four uh, two or other ones were just mma not jiu yeah yeah exactly and 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 that that ties into what we were talking about like the cultural benefit of jujitsu is it starts with one a seed planted that seed starts yeah. growing and it drops more seeds and then next thing you know you have women uh, you, you see women in jordan that that are wearing head covers and training jiu -jitsu. Yes. Right? You, it yes. makes me so happy man it makes me so happy because yeah. it's not about East West. It's not about modern old school. Absolutely. Not at all. Yeah. It's it's about the freedom to to do to try and not be afraid to do it because of a cultural reason. Culture should enhance you, not inhibit you, right? There you go. I love it. Uh, That's uh, exactly uh, how I think about it. Jiu-jitsu is such a gateway to it. Like, you know how they say, like, there's a gateway drugs to bigger drugs? Jiu-jitsu is the gateway <laughs> drug to, to, to cultural awareness, to becoming free to explore life and really become a better version of yourself. So, man. And if I may say so myself, yes. discover yourself, because mm. that's one of the things that, you know, people start to see it like maybe a few months in or uh, sometimes it takes them you know, a year, two years. Uh, but soon enough, people start to rediscover themselves yeah. just from just from going on and sharing the mats and wrestling with, you know, a few of your teammates. Mm -hmm. And that's something that um, it resonates with me a whole lot, because I always say, like, um, the mats, they mm -hmm. never lie. The mats don't lie. So no matter what you person, kind of person you are out there, yes. you come to the mats and the true colors will shine. And that's like, I think, um, part of the reason why that post training, that Hezenia, that mat talk works so well, because you shed all the outside, uh, you know, baggage, influence, stress yes. away. Insecurities. And, you know, everything, everything. Yes. And your true self comes out. 
so very true, man. It, it is like a mirror rather than mats. And and there you go, mirror. And, and even I would add to that is that it's a shaping mat because eventually mm -hmm. that mat shapes your personality because a guy that comes in Correct. thinking his toughness, his machoism will get him very far, eventually it tears that down, brings out the good in him and makes him, you know, you got to learn to talk to people for them to teach you. And if you don't know Absolutely. how to talk to people, you're going to gain that skill in jiu-jitsu, right? Uh, if, if you're a too considerate person, this is, this is a problem that I had with jiu-jitsu. My mm. game never really got good until I realized I can't be too considerate. Like I'm always, I don't want to oh, hurt somebody. Sure. I don't want to be rude. I don't want to be like, I don't, I just, <laughs> I, I'm doing jiu-jitsu because I love it. I started it late in life. I have no delusions of me suddenly becoming world champion and shit. Like, I'm doing it because I love it and it's good for me. So when I train jiu-jitsu, I don't want to be an asshole, <laughs> right? But I realized yeah. that that was inhibiting my game. So it made me a bit more, um, how can I say, not type A, but more proactive in my game. So it helped me mm -hmm. in that sense. Uh, I, 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 I can relate. I, I can relate so much, man. Like I, I, I didn't like, I maybe I skipped this part. Didn't, don't talk about it too much, but I was a very, very introverted kid okay. like, when I was a teenager. And uh, jujitsu sort of helped shape, you know, my confidence, like boost it up a whole lot. You're surrounded mm -hmm. by people that, you know, not only push you to get better in jujitsu, yeah. yeah. you know, but lift you up as a person. It's like you said, the high tide raises all ships. And you, yeah. When you're surrounded by so much positive influence that that really helps bring the best out in you. And that's, yeah. you know, that's what I, that's what I want to give uh, to my students. Because for me, that's the best part of jujitsu is that it helps bring out the best, uh, best habit that could uh, possibly be. And it's, it's not there yet, um, sure. but I'm forever, I, I'm forever grateful for it. You know, it, it, it's funny you, you talk about this and uh, I'll share with you uh, like something personal to me that has to do with jujitsu. And this gives you yes. some insight. Like we were talking about getting to know each other. I don't think we need to do this offline. We can do it right here live and I think people will appreciate Absolutely. it. Absolutely. Uh, growing up, uh, my parents put me into the school system really young. So mm -hmm. I was the youngest kid in class. I graduated high school at 15. I graduated university at 18. Oh, wow. Mashallah. So, uh, it, okay, double-edged sword. I got an early start yeah. to work. But it was yeah. so stressful on me and socially, mm -hmm. it made me so anxious in school. Now, I got yeah. into boxing early on, but boxing just made me more aggressive. It made me vent mm -hmm. rather than control how I feel, my emotions, my anxiety from school. I would mm -hmm. socially be anxious. I was introverted. And at the same time, yeah. everybody was older than me. And like, I, I didn't feel like I belonged at anything. I ended up having to relate to older people because they had more empathy than people my age. Right. Right. Um, so when I got to Jiu Jitsu, it was 26. And then I get into an environment where age doesn't matter anymore. A kid nope, could kick my ass. Not. An adult yeah. can kick my ass. And it fucking healed me. It, ma it made me feel like, damn, I, I, this is the environment I've been seeking for my whole life. And that's what made me fall in love with it. This is the, like the core at me, why I love Jiu Jitsu. It broke down this anxiety socially I had growing up. And now yeah. I feel like I belong in a community that makes sense to me. Amazing, man. That's beautiful. I just love hearing that. That's wonderful. And you, you said you started, you, you said you started late or older, but I, I mean, come on, how old are you now? 27? I <laughs> am. Thank you. Thanks, brother. <laughs> I, I crossed that 30 mark three years ago, so I'm 33. Mashallah, mashallah. Yeah, man, man, like, let me, let, let, me, let me tell you from, I don't want to say experience, because I haven't exactly been there, but I've seen people start in jujitsu in times that many people would call late and many okay. times that others would call early and sure. you know truly time is not the parameter that you should be thinking about I there's agree. only one parameter that you should you should have in your consideration and that is mat time the time that like. you spend on the mat and not so much like oh i could have started so and so well that doesn't yeah. help you to think about that right now it helps not you to all. think forward and mm -hmm. uh, i think your journey is very different than anybody else's journey. Yeah. And that's, yeah. It, that's, that's something else that's a, it's at the core of your um, progression more that's, than anything else. That's true. I appreciate that, man. That, it, it's an insight that I kind of got more aware to later, like not, almost mm -hmm. a purple belt. That's when I really started um, understanding that it's not about starting early. It's not about that. It's just about the attitude, learning how to use mm -hmm. my body correctly at the different phases. Because even if I started when I was young, my game would be mm -hmm. different than it is now. I'd have to adjust it throughout Absolutely. the way. So yep. like you said, time doesn't matter. I, I agree with you totally. So uh, where do you see the, the UAE, the Jordan Middle East region going in the next 10 years when it comes to Arab Jiu-Jitsu? 
Do you see it really oh, blossoming? Man. man, that's a big question. I mean, because oh, yeah. part of it is part of it is my my I, my vision, mm -hmm. you know, my where I want it to be, you know, not just for me but for everybody. And then part of it is all the other things that you know that influence it. So um, I'll tell you what I mean. Like what what I would like to see, you know, looking back uh, to the day where this all started, this jujitsu thing, not just for me, but in general. So you're sure. talking like, you know, the, the 2000s or like uh, late 90s mm -hmm. just in the Middle sort East. Of creeped, creeped into the region. Mm. Um, I believe uh, first in the UAE, even if it wasn't on a, on a public uh, level first, mm -hmm. uh, but that's sort of where it started to spread. Uh, and look at where we are now. That's you know, 20 years. And, you know, we've, we've gone through so much. So what, you know, what I want to see is I want to see like, the teams and the, the people that practice jujitsu in this region, I want to see them properly represented on a, you know, yeah. on a world stage. So now we are represented. There are few select people that actually make it out there and compete on yes. an international level and represent their countries, their teams. Mm -hmm. um, you know, what I want to see is, you know, more of that presence and it doesn't have to be on that scene that everybody else uses. Now it doesn't have to be in IBJJF. It doesn't have to be in, ADCC, it right. could, you know, why, why not? But what I see it happen, what I see, or what I'd love to happen is for us to create, you know, sort of a platform for our own, for this mm. side, like call it this side of the world and have sure. it open to anybody who'd mm. want to, you know, join in and compete. And that platform could very well be uh, the, the UAE JJ uh, right. events. And, and they're working on JJU as well now. It doesn't have to. I think I'm. Uh, I don't hear you for some reason. Hold on. I I can hear you just fine. I don't know if you can hear you're, me or not. I cannot hear you. Zid. Uh, on no worries. No I'm worries. Sure. What happened here? Nope. Take your time. Can you hear me? Interesting. Can you guys hear me on YouTube? Hello. I think I I see it on my monitor. I can see the audio working fine. See if this works. Yep. Can Hello? you hear me? Hi. Weird. Interesting. Uh, can you hear me now? I can. I can. How Perfect. about you? Yeah, I can hear you. Um, Sorry. Uh, the, the headset must be like freaking out for some reason. The battery went low. Okay. No worries. No worries, dude. Take your time. Um, oh, yeah. Very possibly. Um, you were talking about the UA Jiu-Jitsu Federation potentially being that umbrella that could be, but I was also mentioning they have now the Jiu-Jitsu, the J-U-Jitsu, um, what do you call it, association that's coming out. Did you hear about this? I did not. I must have been in the, in the background of the, of the COVID-19. Um, mm. I did hear about the shift to the AGP, the, yeah. the, the, the Jiu-Jitsu Pro. Um, right. But I didn't, I didn't hear, or, or the, and the, of course, the JJIF. You know, the mm -hmm. Nawaza system of competing uh, that has been involving the, uh, the national teams of the world. Right. But, uh, but that one is that what you just mentioned is, is news to me. So. Well. So basically what they're trying to do is they're calling it Nawaza, but the Jiu Jitsu mm -hmm. Nawaza. And they created a okay. national team. So basically UAE Jiu Jitsu Federation and AGP, these are private entities, just like IBJJF. And right. as private entities, they don't hold much weight in international sports associations in order to go to the Olympics. So the UAE yes. has created the JJU, which is a national sponsored sports ah, organization yes. that allows yes. jiu-jitsu to petition to hopefully one day be in the Olympics. And man, that's just fireworks in my brain. Yeah. I, that would be man. a dream come true. That, I was just going to say, that's, that would be the dream. You, know, Unreal. you hear people say that all the time. But if yeah. we get jiu-jitsu to the Olympics... That's that would be like unreal. That would be amazing. Man, t tell me something. All right, so you you've seen what J the UAE has done with jujitsu. They, I feel, yeah. created the blueprint for something that has never been done before. A country has never adopted a martial art into their education system, into every yeah. single na local, in order to benefit them or whatever. We've never seen this before. So no, we're no. never. Like I was talking to uh, Rodrigo Shimpika on my uh, podcast, and we never reaped the fruits of such an experiment yeah. before as as humans. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, I was wondering, now that we kind of see the results, what if countries like Jordan, like Lebanon, like I know, forget yeah. politics, forget money, forget all of this. Just let's talk yeah. theoretically. If they sure. adopt such a pr protocol where kids grow up having a skill set, a tool like jujitsu, 
culturally opening their up their minds, giving them engagement and access to people like Zaid Mirza yourself, who's had such cultural awareness and a martial art. Mm-hmm. What, that, what, what do you think of that? How does that make you feel thinking of such a process? Man, it makes me feel so warm inside. Yeah. You know, not, not just because I love jujitsu and I love everything that's done for me and a lot of people that I, that I know and countless others that I don't know. Um, mm-hmm. But also because it gives me that feeling that, you know, our next generation generations are going to be, you know, more than okay. They're going to be set for life. Yes. You know, you see, you see people come up now and I, I don't mean to sound like I'm some old dude uh, talking about, Oh, you know, in our days it was good, but n- n- it, not at all. I mean, I see, you know, the new generation coming out and I don't want this to sound bad, but you know, they're not ready for life. Mm-hmm. I, I, get you. I just don't see it. You know, I have, I have brothers that fit into that, that category uh, right. of, 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 of uh, this generational gap. And yes. I just, uh, I want them to be like more prepared for life. And you know, that doesn't only mean athletic wise, it doesn't only mean like adulting a sport, but having that mentality, that, yes. that, uh, that growth mentality, um, that you can, you know, overcome obstacles no matter what. That you can like grow mm-hmm. regardless of your circumstances, um, and that you can be part. All of us be part of a community together. Right. Um, yes. Whereas so a so big important. Part of the world and the Arab world now is like if you're if if you're from a different country, then mm-hmm. wait. There's that barrier. Like mm-hmm. it, it doesn't have to be that way. And I think jujitsu is one of those things that could help us cross many of those barriers that were just, you know, it's just the way things were, cultural norms and, and ways that we were brought up. So pivotal. And, you know, a lot of the things negatively impacting the youth these days, mm-hmm. um, they're just, you see those effects every day. And I just, right. I shake my head, but at the same time, I can't sleep at night. Man. Right. I can't sleep at night because I know that there's, there's something that maybe I can do to contribute to yes. that new generation having it better than that, having a better influence in their lives than just uh, screens and games and all the negative things that can corrupt people's lives. Um, you know, so, well so, said. so for so me, well like jujitsu is my, is my way of, of doing that, of giving back, mm-hmm. of making an impact uh, right. the best way I possibly can. You know, mm-hmm. I, I, I'm not in the, in the UN or, you know, like a um, you know, uh, leader of a country or a politician, but, Right. This is the way that I can you know, do it best, the way that I can be the best person and you know, spread you know, that energy, hopefully, to that's the most very, amount of people that I can. That's very well said and says a lot about you, man, because like you said, you don't have to be a leader of an organization to want to do good. There's a, a philosophy where if you're ever feeling bad about yourself or if, if you're fel- ever feeling confused about life, go help somebody that you don't know, right? And you discover something so important about life and what it means to to be part of this earth. We're, we're humans. We're connected socially. We cannot live in isolation. We go crazy. And once you start realizing, we're you, being tested. <laughs> we're being we're being tested. We're being whatever. But th- the idea is, once you realize that game changing mindset, which is by helping others, by being involved in others' growth, you grow. And it's absolutely. Th- it's almost once you learn it and you practice it, it's common sense. But to some people, you see them living life in a rat race where it's me, 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 me. I need to get more stuff, more materials. I need to prove myself. And it's like, man, stop, stop. You're, you're doing the wrong shit. You're going to eventually hit into a wall, right? And you want to save them. And I get totally what you're saying. It's, 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 uh, it's one of my, you know, one of my missions because I, I one one mission is just it's not enough like again i I I still won't be able to be at peace one of my missions is to is to to reach back and help someone else yes and you know i I heard this in a in a speech i'm a i'm a really big proponent of uh, motivational speeches and talks i have my i have my guys that i follow and listen like almost on a daily basis and one of the things that i heard that resonated with me so much and i repeat it to myself almost on a daily basis like when you get to that point that you know you reach that year or almost are there in your own personal growth. Okay. Right. You reach back and you help someone up. Each one, teach one. Mm. Yes. Yes, absolutely, man. Absolutely. Um, Thabit, I, I, I want to keep going, but uh, I'm, I'm seeing in chat when you switched off and back on your Bluetooth, uh, there's like a static yeah. sound that's coming from your voice. And I just, don't, uh, this is so good. I don't want to have any like interference in the audio. Interference. Um, 
Uh, like your Bluetooth now is making a static noise when you talk. It's popping every time yeah. you, you, you say syllables. So maybe if you remove it, would that be okay? Can we try. Yeah, it sure, here? sure. Yeah. yeah. Thanks, Dano. I appreciate you telling me, man. How about now? All right, your, your voice is good. There's a little bit of echo, but at least we can hear you clearly. Can you hear me fine? Yeah, yeah, I can hear you just fine. Oh, amazing, amazing. It's even better. <laughs> good. <laughs> okay, great. great. Um, so, I, use this, I use this tablet. Um, it's, I hate calling it a laptop, but it's not. I use this tablet to run the, uh, <laughs> my, uh, my kids' live sessions on, uh, on Zoom three times a week. And so I I'm literally shouting to this thing from across, uh, across the hall. Like I have my own little mat space back here where I run my uh, live ah, sessions. I've kids. seen that before. Nice. And uh, yeah, I've, no worries. I'm used to shouting at this thing, so it's all good. <laughs> cool, cool. Y you know, man, um, you're a parent, right? Uh, not yet. You're, you're, you're not we a... recently, recently married. We, uh, okay. Me and my wife got married in uh, August last year. I see. Okay, you're just really good with kids. I just for some reason thought you're good. <laughs> you got kids or something. And uh, yeah, funny, funny you should mention that because uh, we, uh, we are expecting. So uh, in October uh, hey! this year, I will... <laughs> Inshallah, bis-salami, man. Alf mabrook. Alf mabrook. I'm so happy. I, it's, uh, that, that's just beautiful to hear, man. Thank you for sharing that with us. My, my pleasure. So, so you mentioned it, and I was like, man, it's it's like, I, I can't keep it in my chest. Allah, khali lak ailtak, khali lak your wife. Inshallah, yahmiha, we yahmi your child. And I hope you guys live a blessed life together, man. This is so... I, I love hearing that. And you're a person that I look forward to seeing the product of Thabit <laughs> with, with oh, your yeah. mindset. Do your both. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> cool, man. I'm happy to hear it, bro. Alf <laughs> Mabrouk. Thank you. you so the, the reason I asked you that is because um, as a parent, I look a lot at my... I have a son and a daughter. My son's four years old and my daughter is... Uh, is she just turned six, man. Time's flying. I'm losing track. <laughs> Habibi. If, um, basically, I look at their future. And when I think about UAE Jiu-Jitsu, what they're doing for kids to secure their future, what you said is a beautiful thing is that kids are graduating they're coming out of university not as well equipped like i i always say this to people is university is teaching us the rules of a game that doesn't exist anymore because thank you everybody's it's graduating so nice somebody else say that. man <laughs> it's 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 crazy because i feel so bad i see people excited throwing their caps graduating and then hitting the market like shit what is this yeah. They didn't tell me about this bullshit. Nobody has a job anymore. People don't know what their life's supposed to be. It's, it's the Industrial Revolution's remnants. Like, we're still in withdrawal from the Industrial Revolution. And we're just starting to realize that you need to start being your own enterprise. You have to work on you inside, build a network around you, build relationships. Because, I, uh, like I told you, I graduated at 18. Uh, I started that life really early. And, and I got this realization really quickly. The sure. best business the best success i had in life had nothing to do with what i learned it was all relations it was all alaqat. what did you learn if you don't mind me asking in your university uh, uh so management and marketing dual major okay Shall um but uh, when i graduated uh, man i i've done so much in life alhamdulillah like i because i graduated early i had the energy and i was still like hungry super ambitious super entrepreneurial starting early i i used to be a bike builder motorcycle builder uh, i used sure. to be an airbrush artist custom painter um <laughs> medical industry i worked in the largest construction company for 12 years i've i've done quite a lot but but i tell you the one resonating message i have from all of that experience is people it's everybody studies uh, accounting everybody studies engineers right uh, you got 10 engineers one is brilliant but he knows nobody uh -huh. one is not so good but he grew up with friends and when they got bullied, he backed them up. And when they were in trouble, he gave them advice, right? And then these friends ended up in interesting companies that need to build buildings, right? The really smart engineer can build the fuck out of that building, but he might not get yeah. the project. The guy that's not so good that helped that kid getting bullied will get that project. This is life. Yeah, so yeah it is. Absolutely. People need to get that realization, realize it's people that make life happen, <laughs> not things. It's true. Um, it's true. But going back to what I was saying about being a parent is for my kids, I see jujitsu as a means because mm -hmm. our real, like the core memories of our lives happen early on, right? When we're kids. Yeah. So uh, when we're kids, that's when we're vulnerable and we don't have our filters up. So when we have relationships with other kids, these we tend to remember and carry for life because they shape us. 
When we're adults at the work, we've built up our filters, we've built up this persona, right? And we don't allow people in so easily. Jiu-Jitsu, because the mats don't lie, regardless of your age, breaks that shit down. Yep. And allows you to build memories with people that form relationships that open doors in life. And, it's not, and, and this is not a, a narcissistic, uh, selfish train of thought. This is fact because you can create beautiful things as well. It's not just for self-gain. It's for getting together with people and doing things that help other people too. And it's not possible without that. So that's why I want to see this everywhere. I want to see governments adopt this. And I want to see every kid at least do jujitsu for a portion of their life so that when they're adults and more aware, they'll be like, let me get back to the mats, you know? Yeah, I'm with you, man. I'm with you 100%. I mean, you, you, it resonates with me so much what you're saying. Um, you know, I was, I was that guy. I was that guy and uh, I, I did engineering. Actually, yeah. so funny, funny you mentioned I wanted to talk I, to you about that. Perfect. I, I, I was an engineering student and okay. um, I was at a, uh, you could say one of the crossroads in my life because I've had a few. It's not mm -hmm. fair for you, for anybody to say the, uh, the crossroads. So, you can, so it was one of my crossroads in life where I had to decide uh, what kind of person I was going to be, what kind of a student, what kind of an engineer, um, everything. I was going to be, and I looked at the, the effort versus return that I could input, um, into, you know, into graduating, into, you know, getting out with said degree with said grade. Right. Mm. I knew hundred percent knowing me and my potential and my abilities. You know, I, I went through school and in mm. school, I put my head down. I studied, I, I closed out the grades so that I can get into a, a good university. This is what, this is how I thought. And, um, and what happened was in university, I saw that another crossroads. I was like, I could, I could put my head down for four years and mm -hmm. I could graduate with a 4.0 or 3.9 or whatever, like something very, very, very high and very attractive. But then I'd be lacking on a lot of those soft skills in right. life. Now I'm, you know, I'm so grateful that I, I didn't do that. Um, cause I chose to divide my attention amongst the thing that mattered to me and the things that mattered to me in life. Like for sure, uh, nice. when it was time to study, it was time to study. It was time to crunch and do homework and, and go to your exams and do well. Okay. Right. Uh, but it wasn't in the sense and in the way that captivated life and everything in it. Right. So when that was over, like I had me time, I had time for myself, whether it's for my, uh, for my training, you know, at the time, I, of course I was doing jujitsu or for my okay. own, you know, self-exploration or, you know, for meeting friends and making connections and building networks and, nice. you know, building relationships that would last a lifetime. You know, people I met in university, I know hundred percent, I would not have had the chance to meet if I locked myself up in a library and studied for four years. hundred you know, percent. So I chose, to, I chose to, you know, meet myself in the middle, so to speak. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a weird way of looking at it, but I, I met that person in the middle. I graduated with, um, was it 3.3 uh, GPA? Mechanical Still way above GPA. most of us. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. <laughs> well, <laughs> hey man, that 3.3 came really, really, really tough. And um, <laughs> but at the same time, you know, I, I, I finished that degree and I was still doing jujitsu. And right at the end of my, um, my you know, finishing engineering or like mm. maybe six months after that, I, I received my black belt in jujitsu. Wow. Um, like they got so two degrees. <laughs> Exactly, it's two. I love and it. I, I no regrets whatsoever. So I, that's, that's sort of why it like, took me back on memory lane into all those years. Wow. And, and, and so, so you graduated. Did you immediately start working in the engineering field? Oh, man, that's a, that's a whole different story in and of itself. I, I was, um, uh, if you know a little bit about the, what happens in the U.S. if you go to school there, um, as an international student, mm -hmm. we don't have the same opportunities and uh, privileges that uh, U.S. citizens or green card holders have. Okay. And so when you apply for jobs, the company has to sponsor your work visa, similar oh. to what happened in the UAE here. Okay. And if that doesn't happen, if the company is not willing to do that for you, then, mm -hmm. uh, you know, go fish, go somewhere else and sure. try if they do. And, and as you can imagine, it's a lot of paperwork and, you know, you know decently yeah. costly for each to do so. Mm -hmm. And so it's easy most of them and when i say most i mean 99 percent to say um wow we were you be a u.s citizen or a green card holder I see. so i faced you know a lot of that applying for jobs in the u.s mm -hmm. and came around another point uh where i just had to decide again what to do whether i should keep on applying and hope to you know maybe get a job offer maybe get an internship uh, something mm -hmm. 
or look at grad school, which is something else that I had in my mind, like an, oh. a vision for me. I wanted to do, uh, I wanted to do business. Okay. I knew I wanted to do masters in business at some point in my life. I just didn't mm-hmm. know when that would be. Mm-hmm. And so I, so I can, I started applying for grad school in business. Cause it fast tracked like, okay, it for you. It, whatever comes first, mm-hmm. I'll take it. And nice. you know, up to that point where I got an acceptance, uh, to go, uh, build my masters in business. Uh, and from the job world. So here I go, I packed up my bags and I went for a one year master's degree in San Francisco, California. So I stayed in the U S for, um, another year. Nice. It's a, it's a quite a hub for jujitsu too, huh? Well, uh, so, so I discovered, I had no idea, lo and behold, you know, I was, I was still training jujitsu, but I was not immersed in the, in the media. Could you you say to know, you know, I knew (laughs) Southern California was a hub for jujitsu, but I had no idea what was in North California until I, I went there and experienced it myself. Um, nice. The madman. <laughs> yeah. I went, I, I, that's where I was. I was, I was, I, I think we're talking about the same person. Yes, we are. <laughs> okay. So I was, I was training with, with him, with uh, Kurt Oceano for, for a year in San Love Francisco. Need, needless to say, that was one of the most significant years of my life. How was that experience walking to the gym? Cause you, did you know Kurt? Like, did you know him from social no. media or no? No, no, no. And it was a little embarrassing, to be honest with you, because um, wow. here I was, I, uh, I was at my apartment in San Francisco and okay. I just got, you know, got my apartment before I was apartment hunting and couch surfing. And it was too messy for me to go and train before that. And finally, I got my place, okay. pulled up my laptop. I was like, OK, here we go. Jiu Jitsu, type it in, uh, show me where the schools are at. And there's a school like literally walking distance from my apartment. And I look at it. Uh, there were two. And I look at it, and one of them says Half Gracie Jiu Jitsu or Half Gracie San Francisco. Sounds I'm right. Like, <laughs> I'm, sound, I'm like, I'm going to check those out. And the other okay. one, I'm going to check it out because, you know, kinda, I, I just want to see what it's about. Sure. And I'm walking through the door uh, with the, the day that I decide to go to training, right? right. I walk in through the door and my, my backpack, my gear, everything. I walk in, and nobody's at the front desk, but there are a bunch of guys on the mat, sort of like Hizania, like post training. Um, okay. And there's one dude um, who is shirtless uh wearing shorts and shirtless doing you know circuit training like jump rope abs pull-ups like doing a whole circuit for himself okay and so here i was and i just you know sat there waiting and this this guy finished his circuit training came over to the front desk said hey how can i help you i'm like um yeah i'm here looking for jujitsu and that guy was kurt osiander but I didn't know. I had no idea. So here I was, I was treating this guy like he was just another person at the gym. I love and it. I'm walking around the mats in class, like afterwards, after I sign up and everything. Sure. And people are all, Kurt this, Kurt that. And I'm like, I'm scratching my head. And I'm like, Kurt, Kurt, <laughs> who do I know that's a Kurt? And I'm like, oh, no. <laughs> I just did this. I went over oh and I'm like, God. oh my God. I had no idea. <laughs> I'm such a huge, huge fan. And Everything and I tell you, I was not connected to jiu jitsu wow. digitally. Wow, he, he the- must have liked that though. I'm sure he liked hey, that. We, we, we have a very good relationship, me and him. Like, I still to this day, like, I mean, every now and again, like, I make it a point to uh, message him. And uh, when nice. I was still in the state and competing, I would see him at tournaments and I go give him mm-hmm. a big hug. Like, he's, you know, one of my uh, one of my mentor figures and you know, me growing up in jiu jitsu, so to speak, yeah. you know, very valuable time I had with him. Kurt is just a character, man. Like I, you know, you know what's very interesting. I didn't, I didn't discover Kurt from jujitsu. I discovered really? Kurt because, like I told you, I used to be an airbrush artist, so I used to do custom paint jobs for motorcycles. And right. in my in my research of airbrush, I got into a phase where I was doing tattoo style paint jobs. Yeah. Okay. And then I just get across because my feed was jujitsu. I was training jujitsu also. My feed was jujitsu, and I started searching on uh, YouTube tattoo style. And the algorithm did something funny, and Kurt was the product. <laughs> no way! Because <laughs> well, you, you're you're researching jujitsu, you're researching tattoo. Google's like um, YouTube's calculating. It's like okay, this guy likes this stuff. Let me make a child, and then Kurt comes out. You see him just scribbling uh, tattoo designs at some student's shop, right? So yeah, yeah, and I. Know. I, I knew that student too. It was one of the people that were there training with us. So, Crazy. So, okay, now I know you're a spiritually connected guy. Do you have any tattoos? I do not. I, uh, I, I will not lie though. I got really, really, really close oh. at one point to getting one. And it was during my California times. It wasn't so, during your Kurt times? 
It was, it was, it was, it was when I was oh, in San okay. Francisco. Oh, okay, okay. Because man, like, I was in San Francisco, um, and I was there surrounded by people who are all tatted. Like, literally, I struggled to find somebody who didn't have a tattoo. Exactly. And my close friends were getting them, and like, you know, trying out different artists. Like, oh, this is a good person. Like, I should, you know, let me hook you up. Do a design going. I'm like, hey, man, listen. At the time, I was still a brown belt. It was all my right. first few months in San Francisco, and I was like. Um, guys, the only tattoo I'll ever think of getting is uh, my black belt uh, around uh, around my arm here, like tied up uh, like that. And they're like, oh, well, when do you get it? I'm like, I don't know. Leave me alone. <laughs> Everybody starts sketching. They start, Kurt's in the corner <laughs> sketching in his weird, like broken finger way. <laughs> yeah. And they, they, they found it. Like my friends like found it like oh, this design, that design. And they were going to oh, actually man. give it to me as a gift. And it, it got that. <laughs> Close. Don't <laughs> fall asleep at the gym. <laughs> oh, dude, goodness! And I, I, I went back home um, that December, uh, um, that that year. I think it was what year was it? 2013. I went hmm. home uh, for uh, Christmas break, or something, and I was sharing it with my, uh, you know, with my brother in front of my parents. And my dad goes, "No." What do you mean? he's like, "No." <laughs> I'm like, okay, well, that's another. It's not even a discussion with them. It doesn't matter how old we get, man. It's not even a discussion. You'll be you'll be banned from Ramadan, man. <laughs> It'll be I, I It'll be do, repercussions. I, I, it's not that I, you know, actively decided against it, but I was like, okay, if I'm gonna, if this is gonna happen, I'm gonna have to scheme around it a little bit differently. And you know, a few yeah. years later, it just kind of fell out of my uh, interest. It's it's because you moved away from Kurt Osiander, man. I imagine like the peer pressure must have been huge. <laughs> I know, but the, well, like the first thing, like, because uh, I, I was looking at your profile and I checked out your your website, which is very well done, by the way, the website that you have. Which um, one? Uh, T Thabit BJJ. My, my website. Yeah. yeah. I, I I made that one. <laughs> yeah, man. Th that was, and I know, and I can, I feel like we got this mental connection right now. I feel like that was a late night Sahara where you're like, I need to do a website in Khalata. You dished it out in one night. <laughs> It was literally that, and then I just <laughs> build up that I love after it. that. Just that's how it works, man. I yeah. love it, man. But th that, that's the thing. When I was reading your bio, and then you talked about Kurt Ossian, and I'm like, I gotta ask him if he has a tattoo. There's no way he went to Kurt, <laughs> and nobody tried to like buzz next to him. Akid. <laughs> like next to the mats, people getting tatted. Like exactly, totally. bro. Yeah. That's what I imagine in that gym, man. Because Mahus, like, he's crazy for tattoos right now. Yeah, but he's you know. He's uh, he's his own self, you know, and it's yeah. it's funny. He's it's like you said, he's one of the most interesting characters mm. yes. uh, you'll ever meet. And if you haven't met him, you know, one day you really should, really, really should, as he's such a special human being. Yeah. Um, and he has this very, very positive aura around. I get that him. feeling. Like, yes. Helps everybody, and he's you know he's as crazy as the videos make him uh, look, but he's <laughs> such a interesting person, right? He's not the crazy kind that you would you know be weirded out about or freaked out about no he's just a right. genuine, genuine human being um one of my, one of my favorite stories uh and memories really with kurt is um and it's a it's a picture that i put up like uh, sometime back um one time i was riding a bike my bike in san francisco it was mm -hmm. you know late night going back home in the rain and okay. uh bike wheel gets stuck in the in the in the tram track kind of like a The, the, it's a train that runs like on top of the roads gotcha. and it, my bike you know, gets stuck in the middle and I try to get out of it and you know, it doesn't work out. The bike, I end up falling. The bike ends up like crashing on top of my leg. Ooh. So my ankle gets sprained like crazy sprain. Like Shit. it's like, yeah. and here I am, you know, in the middle of the road, like 1 AM, 2 AM by myself. Okay. You can imagine all sorts of things run through my head. And the first thing that I think about is, man, how am I going to play jujitsu? Oh man, I know the feeling. <laughs> okay. Man, like, <laughs> Crazy people. I, I, paddled, I paddled with one leg all the way back home. And I was like, you know what? I'll sleep it off. It'll be fine tomorrow. That's it. This, this is what I did to myself. <laughs> okay. And, uh, it was not, you know, it was not okay. I had to, Shit. I had to take, I was away from jujitsu for two weeks, I think. And I, was, I had like a, a brace on it. Like I'm that you get at the pharmacy. That, that Did it break? The, no, no, it's not a broken. It, it was okay. a sprain. I went. Okay. It was just nothing broken, thank God. Wow, um, okay. Walking around with the, this this Velcro uh, brace that you get at the pharmacies, and you <laughs> barely get my foot in the in the shoes. Okay. And this is during grad school, right? So it's not like me chilling at home. It was like me having, having to go to class. Jumping and, around. You know, 
ground and you know putting weight on it it got like more inflamed and it got worse oh, um and then i just couldn't take it anymore like in two weeks the swelling went down a little bit but i just okay. couldn't take it i went I went to the gym one day and I just sat there. I was, I'm not training. I just want to be around the mats, you know? Nice. And old Kurt comes by. Um, hey, what's up, David? How's it going? And not so, okay, Kurt, nothing much. But, you know, this, this, this happened. My foot is sprained. I'm, I'm just here to, you know, be around you guys and everything. He's like, oh, why don't you tape it? I'm like, what? He goes, why don't you tape it? Then maybe you can, you know, move a little bit. Or, you know, you don't have to play stand up, but you can maybe play guard like on your back. What a guy. Like, well, I never I, mean, I, I wouldn't even know where to start. He's like, get some tape from the pharmacy and come to next class. I'll show you how. And I kid you not, man, Kurt Osiander would take my foot before every class every day wow. for the next, I think, two months, three months. Wow. Into first competition uh, as a black belt, which, uh, you know, I, I had to obviously take my foot. And here he was with all his students that he groomed since, you know, babies, since white belts. And, you know, even he had not black belts competing that day. And he took the time in the competition venue to like, you know, here, put your foot on my knee. And he literally taped up my foot. He's like, you're good to go. What a so, guy, man. That's such a beautiful I'll story. I'll never forget that. He's the person who taught me how to take that foot. And ever since then, like, if it just so happens that my foot gets, you know, mm. busted from training or from a submission or something, I know how to take care of it. And I know how to take care of my students' wow. feet. Fingers as well, obviously. But, you know. Of course, of course. You know how in Arabic we say he grew in my eye, kibir <laughs> Any, 100%. That's literally like he grew in my eye from this story, man. That's such a nice one. And, and it also says something about you because I'm sure he wouldn't have done that if he didn't sense that you really longed for being on the mats. Like he almost like connected with you on a jujitsu level. Yeah, you know, I, we, we, def we definitely did. I mean, I could, you know, you could kind of tell when, um, when someone is fond of you, especially an instructor yes. or somebody who's a, 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 in a position of leadership or anything. And I, I was just so grateful for you know, I never like, you know, tried to get anything more out of it. Like I wanted, you know, to come into the mats and learn. And I was one of the people that he would call to train with and he would like, he trained with everybody. Right. But Very cool. limited time on the mats. Yeah. And, you know, as a, as a, as a leader, as that guy in the gym, mm -hmm. that head guy, um, everybody wants to train with you, but then you have to, you know, sort of balance and, um, you know, choose your training partners and make sure you're getting good training at the same time. I just felt sort of, you know, humbled that he would, you know, pick me like, more often than you know other people that have been there maybe for years what an experience that must have been man you know thabit it's unbelievable as you're talking and as we're unraveling the the onion of thabit right <laughs> it's it's now starting to click it's now starting to click and i want to get to what everybody wants to hear from you entropy entropy <clears throat> everything you've told me so far has formed and mixed in this big pot of thabit and has created a very nice recipe for a person that's passionate to teach from experiences, yeah. from coaches you've been through, from not. Where, like, f first of all, why Dubai? Can you just tell me uh, real quick, like, where's the connection to Dubai? Because you grew up in Jordan, right? I did, I did. So okay. my, uh, my family moved to Dubai uh, a year, well, the, the same year that I went to university, that I left Jordan for university. Uh -huh. uh, my family moved to Dubai. Uh, my dad had gotten a job offer. Mm -hmm. uh, here in Dubai. Nice. And uh, he moved a year before I graduated uh, high school. So okay. he was here a year before all that. And then um, they were basically waiting for me to graduate because mm -hmm. I was in my senior high school. Okay. And then the family was going to move to Dubai. And so they've been here since 2008. Okay. Like, family. and, um, you know, how I, how and, how and why I came back to Dubai is like a whole different story. It's like a, a, a journey for me through, I dare say, through time and space, like a full on Whoa. breakthrough into my character. So, excuse me. Um, Interesting. Okay. But, but really, the, 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 the short uh, answer of it is my family's here. And that's how the reason that I came back uh, to Dubai. So, that's the first reason of uh -huh. me, me setting up uh, the academy, setting up the business, the dream uh, here in Dubai. And the other reason is, is my students, you know, and that's something that I'll, you know, I'll, I'll never be able to tell you enough about, like, we can talk about it for, for 10 years, you know, I'll still have things to tell you about my first uh, group of students here in the UAE, that um, when it, when the time came for me to decide whether I wanted to stay and, you know, build something here, right. build legacy here, or go somewhere else, um, you know, they were, they were a huge defining factor in me wanting to stay here. So, when did you uh, when did you start connecting with these students? Was it in the UAE or before? 
Because I know well, you've got well. roots in Lebanon, you've got roots in Jordan, well, you've right. got... Yeah, everywhere. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, mashallah, like everybody, listen, everybody that I talk to you knows you and loves you. Like there's nobody. Then uh, all of my friends that talk to me, they're like, you got to talk to Thabit, man. He's such a cool guy. He's somebody that you have to hear from. So I appreciate the love of everybody, even if I don't know you. <laughs> man, <laughs> you'd be amazed. You'd be amazed how many people like that don't know you, that you don't know them personally, but that are following you on Instagram and social media and they're excited to come train with you. And I'm excited for them to go and try that. Me too included. So I, am, I, am, I, am too. I, I cannot, like you said a few words that made me want to dig a little bit deeper. You said a travel through time and space to get back to Dubai. Can you give me an idea of why it felt like a, a paradigm oh. shift in your life? No, dude, uh, uh, I, I'll, go, I'll go into all that. Like I'll, uh, I'll, let me like, my brain okay. works in like compartments. So let me, let me finish on through the, what, you, what you asked Let's me go. from earlier. Let's go. Be sure to remember that because it's a, Again, a pivotal point uh, in my okay. life. Um, so in 2000, December 2015, I came back to Dubai. Um, and I came back at that time. I was back and forth between the U.S. and Dubai because I was at that time trying to stay in the U.S., trying to you know, be there, get a, get a working visa uh, so that I don't have to worry about my status so that I can you know, make money legitimately. Yes. So, you know, I, can, I don't have to worry about that because I was postgraduate school. Okay. Okay. And, um, you know, again, like that part's going to, uh, I'll talk about that here in a little bit, but, um, I came back to Dubai in December mm -hmm. and, uh, December, 2015. And at that point, uh, my, my goal, my aim was sort of to come back to the U S with mm -hmm. a, with a, with a working, with a work visa, a form of a work visa that's meant for athletes and, and artists. Wow. Okay. So that the, Give me something, give me something concrete that I can at least stay in the country for a good few months and kind of figure out where I want to be and how I want to be living, right? Okay. Because um, I wasn't living there on a permanent basis. And again, more on that uh, a little bit later. Okay. So I came back and uh, I, submit, I had submitted paperwork for that uh, visa application. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I had, to, I had to go back anyway because my time, my visit time during that period expired in the US and I had to go back to Dubai. Oh. And here I was waiting hear back on that that status where um and at that time you know whenever i was in dubai i was training at uh, i was doing my jiu-jitsu training at team Nogueira dubai i'm sure you're familiar with them yes of course what years were those that was 2015 and like me going back and forth was hmm. basically 2013 2014 2015 we may have shared the math at some point okay it's very very possible i'm yeah i, I'm, I wouldn't put it past us um and so here I was like, you know, normal training, normal, um, anything for me, like my time at that time in Dubai, I'm not going to lie to you was, um, waiting for my visa to come out so I can hit the ground running, uh, yeah. where at least where I had at that time envisioned myself. And just mm -hmm. one day just training in the gym, I saw uh, a friend of mine, a very, very good friend of mine. His name is Zahi Efrem. I don't know if you've met him before. Yeah. Another person that has a lot of love for you on social media. <laughs> I love Zahi. I met Zahi that day at the gym and I was like, hey man, I didn't know you were in town because to my knowledge, he was in Lebanon. Mm -hmm. He was running Arabs MMA. It was a, a website uh, at the Very time. Very popular. Mm. Yeah. And um, he was like, hey man, what are you doing here? I'm like, oh man, I'm here for, for now, I guess. Um, mm. I, I, was, I, I was in two minds because I was waiting, but at the same time, the more time elapses, yes. uh, the more I'm leaning towards, okay, maybe I should you know, find some way to make money here because I don't want to be just in limbo and you know, yes. not have that option. And, you know, money, uh, money is, you know, I, I, I don't like to think that money is the most important thing, but for sure it gives you options. Absolutely. And I need, that. and so that he came to me that day and he was like, Hey man, well, I, are you looking for work? I'm like, well, it depends what kind of work he goes. Well, I know this guy who's opening up a UFC gym in Dubai and they're looking for a jujitsu coach. Do you want me to send your information there? I'm like, eh, like literally in that fashion, like I'll send you my, <laughs> My, okay. my papers and uh, this guy uh, he's like okay cool i'll let you know uh, what happens and then the next you know two days later maybe it was one day later i don't know time's a bit fuzzy but like it was so soon after that it, for me it felt like i took a nap and i received the call uh at that time wow okay and, uh, call from the the man who was the the, the chief uh, operations uh, officer ceo of ufc gym at the time hmm. uh called me up and he was like i i got your uh your credentials from Zahi. I was wondering if you had time to talk about this opportunity that we have. And I'm like, yeah, okay. So, um, talked on the phone, 
met in person. Uh, I think we met in person twice. Uh, and they offered me a job to be the head of the uh, jiu-jitsu program at UFC gym, the first UFC oh. gym in UAE, uh, in the region, really, because uh, it was a fr- it's a franchise based in the U.S. It's a master sure. franchise. Yes, of course. One here uh, in the UAE, they need somebody to run the jiu-jitsu program. That's and, an impressive offer. And I took it. And, and for me, it was like I, I'm a person that likes clarity so I can sort of plan my yes. presence and my impact there again like my my journey has been one of of impact not just you know what i want to accomplish for myself absolutely uh, but i was like to do this i need to know like what you want from me do you want do you have a program that you want me to run or do you want me to create my own program right and this was an interview and he and he goes well if you were to create it what would it look like hmm. okay give me a few days nice and here i go like on my little like uh, notepad or something i still have that scribble paper somewhere i never throw these things away i wrote Amazing. down um my curriculum for teaching jiu-jitsu uh, that is still now the base of the curriculum that i run at uh, entropy jiu-jitsu for my uh, for my beginners program and you got this from what your belief system tells you it should be or is it from something you experienced well both both so okay. i'm glad you asked that I, I com- uh, in my years of, of jiu-jitsu and traveling all over the world and training with so many different people, different coaches, different academies, right. um, I, was, I was blessed. I was truly blessed to be uh, exposed to that much of a, of a, ver- of a variety. That's true. Um, I, picked, I picked and choose what the things that I liked most, that I thought applied most, not only applied most uh, to me, that I could learn, that I could, um, that I could teach, mm-hmm. and that I thought would be the most crucial and essential for somebody coming up in jiu-jitsu you know like i i i, I didn't care so much about what you would call these days the, the the fancy moves or the really advanced moves like i learned them for myself right you know and i was practicing them as well can join me at the same time but the, mm. the the main like cornerstones if you will of what i consider to be um you know a fundamental jiu-jitsu program what you will need to learn mm-hmm. for you to become the best jiu-jitsu practitioner uh, you could possibly be is mm-hmm. parts and pieces that I picked up from many places that I went uh, over the years. And, uh, sure. you know, one of them is, um, is the, the gym that I trained at mostly while I was doing my engineering degree in the state of Indiana. It's a gym called impact zone. And okay. my very, very good friend and brother, uh, professor Carlos Soto, he runs, uh, that gym over there. He's, mm-hmm. uh, he's a black belt and, you know, we, we've known each other since purple belt days. Oh, and, okay. uh, grew a lot uh together i grew a lot there he did as well and i learned a lot uh from him running in the gym and teaching there we we taught con- we taught together at that place okay. for so many years, like uh, you know six seven years uh where we did that there and that was wow so you've had a lot of years of teaching oh yeah i mean it, you know I, I i i wasn't the main person teaching sure but i was teaching there. Mm. um even before that when i was uh, new at the university I'm sorry. I'm like going off on tangents here. No, 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 no. Go, go for it, dude. There's no right way. Go for it. Uh, <laughs> I was, uh, in my first time in the university was like me going off into the States. I arrived in a, on a cold January in the state of Indiana and my university was uh, Purdue University. Yes. It's a, it's a college town, which means basically the city is the university. The school closes down. There's nothing happening in town. Mm. Right? Here I was struggling to like, okay, where am I going to do jiu-jitsu? <laughs> and I was fortunate enough to have a few guys um, who were my uh, my teammates back from when we were in Jordan, who trained oh. with us, uh, Zaid Mirza, back when. I was, again, I was purple belt at the time, and they happened to be there. And they were like, nice. oh, they, they have jiu-jitsu here, but let's go to the, the gym. They have, like, wrestling mats, and we can, like, you know, roll or do stuff there. So I'm like, okay, Very cool. cool. Um, you know, one thing led to another. One day, we found a group of people doing just nogi on the mats. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, it looks like jujitsu, but it looks kind of weird jujitsu. And mm-hmm. so I stepped in and I introduced myself. And uh, the guy who was running classes, his name is Konstantin uh, Hatzis. At the time, he was a blue belt who moved from uh, moved from uh, Eddie Bravo School from Tenth Planet. So I he see. moved uh, there for grad school, and he was teaching them nogi. And I was like, can I join you guys? And he goes, yeah. Like I joined their class, and you know, we trained, and uh, you know, we rolled, and I did better i was a purple belt i beat him at the time and he goes and he asks me to start teaching them nice. i go um I, I i'd love to like i want to train uh but if you'd like me to teach i mean i'm i'm flattered i'm honored and oh. you know that, that was really my 
you know, my first solid teaching experience where I was the top guy that people looked to for, uh, for instruction, for advice, for everything. Mm-hmm. And, uh, it was mostly no gi cause not many people had gis. Um, right. So when I wanted to train in the gi, I'd ask, uh, some of the guys who had them to bring them in the weird roll after class and stuff. Did um, it feel natural I, to you to suddenly take that leap and start teaching people? Or did it, did it feel like something that just fell in place and you had no choice? Uh, absolutely. It felt natural. It felt like, like looking back at that now, it felt like ex- it was exactly what was supposed to happen. Wow. But at the mm. time, I didn't like I didn't even think about it for a split second. I'm like, okay, cool. Like I know jujitsu. I'm happy to share it with you guys. Uh, let's do this. And we ended up starting uh, the Purdue Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu Club. And, wow. Uh, which at the time it was just it was nothing. Like they wouldn't. Uh, you'd have to be in that university. You'd have to be recognized for two years as a student organization. Okay. active student organization before you uh, became a sports club. If you became a sports club, you'd get funding, you'd get time slots, you like you get like many more things. And now I look back and I, I see the guys there now, the club is still active. They That's have cool. their own mat space, their yeah. own exclusive mat space for jujitsu over there. And you have people like coming up, uh, going students going there, you have the mats packed with like 30, 40 people, um, consistent basis. And it's, it's just amazing to me to see that happen because you left that started, legacy there. We started that and I, I was, I was actually able to go there uh, a few years later a seminar at the club that I originally started, which was amazing for me. It was really like heartwarming and, and it, it was, it what was, an experience, man. That's fantastic. Um, and that, and after that, after I graduated from university is when I moved to impact zone with, uh, with Carlos full time, um, okay. because after you graduate over there, some of the rules say that you cannot be like a, an officer if you're mm-hmm. not a student at the university. Sure. Um, and so even before that, while in school, I would train at the other gym two days a week and I would teach three other days uh, during the week. And, okay, I get you. Uh, my physical training on, the, you know, on, on my own time on another day whenever I didn't have to study, basically. So that's sure. That's kind Were of you competing? Thing. Yes, I was. Yes, I was. So I, I, I actually competed for the first time uh 2009 it was september i believe september 2009 is the first time i competed in the us okay um that's you let you know i arrived in january uh-huh. and uh after like a good few months where i kind of discovered that club and we started training and teaching and all that and okay. uh, it was my first competition and in that competition i actually competed against uh my friend carlos who like i ended up going and you know we became brothers like literally after that we had a match in the absolute division. And okay. uh, after that, I was like, I was like, Hey man, you're the best guy that I've trained with in a very long time. I'd like to train with you. So I That's started incredible. attending classes at his gym. And that was for me, like one of the most humbling experiences I've ever had. Cause um, I, I'm not going to say like, I was hardly the best guy back in Jordan mm-hmm. or, mm-hmm. but I was pretty confident in my jujitsu and my abilities. Mm-hmm. And he was the first opponent that showed me a side of my game that was really, really vulnerable. And mm-hmm. then I needed to work one way or another. I was like, Hey, we're going to train together. And you know, that's that. So uh, on the, on the first was, experience with him, he showed you your vulnerability or was it after getting to know your game a little bit? Well, uh, both. So the match okay. didn't go my way at all. That's oh, the, oh shit. That. Okay. <laughs> oh, yeah, absolutely. In, uh, in my previous uh, tournament experiences in Jiu Jitsu, people either didn't know how to, how to take you down or throw you. Uh, which meant like they pulled guard or they like, went down to their, uh, to their ground, to their butts, uh, yeah. or they were judo guys who knew how to throw you, but then didn't know how to control the fight. Okay. Which was you know, for me, I was like, if I land on my back, it's okay. If not, like I'll play at top. So I didn't even see it coming. And Carlos was, ha- has a wrestling background. Ooh. So he literally got in for a double leg and kept on like, you know, dominating the match after that. Um, wow. Winning the match on points, uh, it was a takedown pass mount and, uh, like time, uh, time finished after that, after I escaped from that position. But, um, they, so that particular side of my jujitsu was vulnerable to me. And that's one of the things that, you know, I learned to get better at. Mm-hmm. And at the same time, uh, you know, he'll tell you that his top game got you know, really, really good, uh, training with somebody that's very good on their back. Cause I see you know, he got very well challenged, even in competitions at the time. Me, you know, yeah. and, 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 uh, did you train wrestling with him or just jujitsu together? Well, both, because like he taught gi and no gi. So, mm-hmm. and his his way of teaching jujitsu is very heavily influenced by both wrestling and judo. So, oh, like he'll yeah. incorporate 
it was one of, it's one of the things that I actually do now at, at, uh, at our academy at Entropy. I incorporate uh, concepts of wrestling and judo that apply to jujitsu, that make your jujitsu better. So you, if you know a little bit about wrestling like uh, and judo, you'll know that um, there are certain, there are, like, there's a huge portion of those two arts um, that in jujitsu doesn't work well for you. Okay, mm -hmm. in wrestling, they don't like to put their back on the mat, so they'll give you the turtle position, which gives jujitsu people back control. And yes. judo guys, uh, they'll throw you and they'll continue rolling off, um, yes. which like it's it can be a scramble or something, and they're not particularly good on the ground. So uh, there's both sides to it, and sort of builds in to making your jujitsu game better. So um, sorry, that was a long I, I riff like about. That. Not at all, man. I, I, actually, that, that excites me even more to come train with you because that is the hole in my game. The stand-up portion, as was exposed in one of my podcasts, the, oh. one of the head professors that I train under, uh, when I was <laughs> asking him, what's the worst part of my game? He didn't hesitate. He's like, you're stand-up. <laughs> He's just like throwing it out there. So we're going to be working on that together. But th we went off in this tangent, this important one, because you were explaining how that impacted your decisions towards the UFC gym correct. curriculum. Correct, correct. Um, so I design. So fast forward, I'm designing the curriculum. Yes. My jujitsu program uh, over there. So not only did I have to design the the curriculum for for adults, but in my mind, I'm like, okay, well, we're gonna have kids, right? So kids as well. Sure. Modified uh, the curriculum to make it adaptable for children, uh, to make it more, you know, uh, a to make it more building uh, building their uh, their gymnastic ability, their movement ability. So it's not so much jujitsu focused, so to speak, especially right. in young kids. Right. Um, but it's also there, right? It's also there. The jujitsu concepts are there, but they're more taught to them in a in a in a game sense, in a movement sense, in a, okay. uh, a different way with adults. Um, and I also had to construct the, my the, you know one on one time. How much of that did I want out of my full time? You know, how much I wanted to be compensated for it? Like a, a lot of things. A lot of yes, things of went course. into. And, and, and just uh, not, not 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 to interrupt your train of thought, but because I want to touch on this before we drive through this topic, it's. When you first said that your friend applied for you for that UFC gym, you said, meh, go for it. But I feel like deep down, like you said, meh, and then you wrote a brochure. The curriculum went back. Details. That wasn't a meh, man. That wasn't a meh. <laughs> um, I'm not lying to you. Um, it was not only me. Like, I I'd be lying if I said, like, uh, any part of my life is only attributable to me. I always had um, my, um, I always had my support system and that always like changed and shifted throughout the years. And um, at that time it was postgraduate school time. And one of the, one of the pivotal characters in my life, uh, my very close friend uh, went to grad school with me, um, liked jujitsu, but didn't, sorry, didn't particularly do jujitsu. Okay. Uh, but he was, you know, he still is like uh, one of my uh, biggest confidants and, you know, someone that I, you know, brainstorm with about different topics. It doesn't have to be jujitsu. It can be anything, right? Sure. And, and I had like one of those phone calls with him. I'm like, one, two, three, this is what's happening. Mm -hmm. He goes, do you want this job? I'm like, man, I don't know, but I'd like, I'd like to be offered this job for I sure. See. It would, I get you. It would, make, it, would, it would feel that, that that hole of you know i'm th that like something Purpose. concrete that, that somebody somebody gave me like here we value your your jujitsu or you know your your ability to teach or, or yes. you, we value you, right they don't even know me yet they don't even know if i can teach but we value you and we're gonna offer you something so i i guess like i wanted that part of it he goes okay so write this program as if you would uh not just for this job write this program for Timeless, like you want to be able to look back at this and build, uh, build for years and years and years. Write the program how you would want to be taught if it was you. Now we see. If it, if, you, if it was you, if you were the student, write it how you would like to be taught. Yes. So I'm like that. That just lit a light bulb in my head, and I just I went at it. I went at it. I, I wrote that uh, program on a piece of paper. I obviously digital now, but yes. Um, uh, but that, you know that's where it started. Um, I got offered the job, and I started there in February of 2016 mm. it took some time until, uh, the place was not actually built when i was having my interviews it was being built in business bay and uh, we started a soft opening kind of in you know mid uh, mid february mm. and and that's where it started right we had a we had an open day where anybody was allowed to come and try a jiu-jitsu class um right. they, you know i taught it there i showed them a little demonstration and then you know classes started like i put a class schedule on there and i started i was teaching a lot and it was just me like i didn't have anybody helping me with classes 
Mm -hmm. uh, I was running the program. And even if, you know, at the time uh, I would ask like, Hey, if, you know, I'd love to have some help. Like if you guys need references, I'll refer some people uh, right. to come over and help me coach. I go, Oh, like we'll, we'll uh, send us, but like, you know, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll make sure that's taken care of. Um, but at the beginning it was, man, it was a lot. There was, there was days when I teach a 7 AM mm -hmm. and then it's in the afternoon at like, I don't know, four to five. And then I would have a five to, uh, sorry, uh, six to 7 PM, seven mm -hmm. to 8.30. Um, that was three times a week. And the other two days uh, were like 10 AM, again, 6 PM, 7 PM uh, to 8.30. So and, most and of my kids time. kids every day? Kids were three times a week, I think, uh, if I'm not mistaken. It was Sunday, Tuesday, no, four times, Sunday, Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday. Saturday morning was a, was a good uh, kids class. So going from jujitsu for Thabit to going to jujitsu for the world, <laughs> how did that yeah, feel like? Man, it, it felt like, it felt like so exhilarating. It felt like, you know, this is good. my, this is my <laughs> okay. calling. And, uh, this is my calling. And, and this is what I, I feel like it feels so right to do this. It's what I was made to do. This is what it felt like. Wow. And I, I absorb, uh, I accepted that what I can, what I still consider, uh, not only my, uh, responsibility, but mm -hmm. the privilege, uh, for me. And yeah. so I was, I was, I was at it religiously you know, diligently. Like there were times where I slept like as little as three hours a night, but I'd wake up very early to go to my morning jujitsu class. And then in the middle there between classes, sometimes I would have, uh, PTs also, uh, mm -hmm. while I was in this little bit of note cliff note there, I learned, uh, how to, I learned the basics of strength and conditioning so I can cool. teach people basic strength and conditioning. So I'd also have PT sessions between mm -hmm. my jujitsu class most days wow so and you went super in like you went deep deep end i was at the gym from morning till night every uh, day of the week except for friday and uh -huh. friday literally my only activity was this is a remote control i was like <laughs> i can't move that was the only activity on fridays <laughs> <laughs> i'm uh, sure man in the six and that that's where so that's where it started man really like for me in dubai for us for for my team in dubai yeah. that's, where started. that's where i met most of the people that not most like the core I call them, are training with me today were yeah. my students when i started teaching in ufc gym and i was there until uh july no no october i was seven months i was there until october of that year 2016 yeah. october um i resigned and um you know, literally the day after I left, I was, you know, I, my mind was all over the place. Uh, I don't know if you've ever had the transition of, you know, leaving a place of that you spent so much time in, yes. but I had this blank space in my mind and I just wanted to, you know, decompress and then think about my next steps. And here, here, my, uh, my students go and they, uh, they create uh, a WhatsApp group and they go, where are we training tomorrow? Love it, man. You're not uh, getting away from us, man. You might leave the mats, but the mats gonna come to you. <laughs> I see that message, man, and I was, I, I was fueled, fueled like right when I thought I was wow. gonna, you know, sit down and bunker down for a while. I was fueled for, I dare say, for life. You know, there are many times when, um, when I had like really, really difficult. Uh, I, 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 sorry, I don't like the word difficult. Challenging, very challenging days. Of long hours of training, um, you know, you, as you can imagine, like uh, the different kind of different kinds of stress that come along with it of having to deal with, you know, management and bosses and this and that and balancing that with my own uh, personal life. Um, you know, at times where I said, like, man, I, I don't even know um, why God brought me back uh, from the U.S. And you know, I on de on on many days I'd walk to the mats and I find like my students just getting ready for class and chatting. I I look over and I. I would just, you know, between me and myself, I'd look up and I say, you know what? If it was for them, okay. Wow, man. Wow. Now so, uh, you were getting at the root of that, and and then I love it. I love hearing this this mindset that you have. It's it's so pure hearted. It's refreshing as hell to hear, man. It's it's nice to hear somebody have that kind of mindset. Cause man, you are a very well educated guy. And and like when you decided to put education on a back shelf, you got a 3.3, man. Most people they're hustling and they can't get that 3.3. So you got an engineering degree, you got your uh, postgraduate degree. And this is what filled that passion, that 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 warmth in you. Where, where are your yeah. degrees? Like are you working in engineering at all now? Oh, if only you knew. Oh, you're about to. I uh, I have a day job. 
Uh, that's, that's, that's my current visa status in Dubai is I'm a project manager. I work for uh, Majd al Futim, the Carrefour. Okay. Uh, yes. Al-Futim. I build Carrefour hypermarkets in different parts of the world. Wow. Wow. So, so we, yeah. we have interacted on a business side. <laughs> yeah. yeah uh, well, not, not directly, but CCC, uh, Consolidated Contractors Company, that's the uh, oh. business uh, my father's been a part of for a very long time. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah, yeah. That's a that's a whole other podcast, man. That's <laughs> a whole other podcast. <laughs> Let's uh, stick to yeah. jujitsu. <laughs> we will. We will. But as you know, it, it's funny because there are certain things that you know uh, are part of our journey for reasons that we don't, you know, we, we never, we may never know about. And then you know, sometimes it you know it comes out there. Um, yeah. I was I was meant to stay. I was meant to come back to Dubai. I was meant to stay in Dubai. I was meant to um, go work in jujitsu and. Yes. I was meant to feel that um, that appreciation, and I was meant to feel that acceptance. You know, not just from uh, from family, from friends, from people. You know, maybe uh, people who supported me, and you know, others who uh, I, w- I don't want to say doubted, but had mm-hmm. you know had their skeptics. You know, right? Here's this guy who has two degrees, and mm-hmm. he says he wants to do jujitsu, and mm-hmm. um, I feel like that gave me a very very big push. Mm-hmm. So I was a big part of it, and then meeting those amazing group of people my first uh, group of uh, students in the uae um, talking to them about jiu-jitsu about my journey about everything and then they know that how uh, how close we all got i mean i wouldn't have considered you know continuing on the teaching path you know in in the uae maybe maybe somewhere else mm-hmm. if it weren't for the kind of bond that i had developed with uh, those group of students and um worthy of mentioning that uh, my wife was among that group that's where really we met. Yeah, so that's another that's Man, another what, reason. What a blessing this jiu-jitsu is, bro. One of the biggest blessings, you know. Unbelievable, that, uh, man. Is that I connected with uh, with someone that um, has a passion for what I have a passion for. Yes. And, uh, you know, someone that relates to me so much when I say, I need to do jiu-jitsu or I need to run class or uh, I, I want to build this this uh, this dream of mine. And it's that's you know, so it's, beautiful it's, to it's hear, man. It's a sport, you know. Um, I, I like to hear this and, and you know like I relate to you so much the more you talk the more I feel like man we should have sat down a long time ago because hey, all time is all we got man we, we do we do alhamdulillah like man I, I'm, I'm people come into your life at certain points of time just like Zaid Mirza came into your life just like your wife comes into your life it, it's, it's been the same with me as well like I'm I'm the kind of guy that uh, likes challenges as you said not difficulties challenges and I've gone into businesses I had no business being in like custom bike building I'm not an engineer marketing and management I didn't mention any engineering in my background and uh, it was like I had a very good job I was doing very well in life it's just I didn't feel like I was being me and I'm a creative person I'm a social person so I, I relate to you in the sense of a the challenge of proving that if I want to do something I can be it you didn't become right. Thabit. You didn't become the competitor that you are. You didn't become the person that you are without self-belief that you can do something better, right? Yep. Um, but at the same time, what fell apart for me in my motorcycle business was the people side. I yeah. felt alone and abandoned in a garage painting in a, like, a face mask with like, clear, a clear coat all around me and, and toxins. What happened with jujitsu with me, and I feel like that's what's happening, what happened with you to start teaching is... The passion continued because of the people. You started because of the passion. It interests you. It excited you. You wanted to be good. But then once you got that connection, it, it drove through as a business, let's say, as a, as a passion business. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah, I could. It, it, okay. it got stuck there for a minute, but I, I can okay. hear you. Okay, perfect. So let's talk about the conceptualization of um, entropy and... Yeah. Like, listen, uh, b- before, it's not a normal gym for me. Sorry, but when I, when I, when I say entropy, I see your Please t-shirt. I want to hear more about it. Brother, I, I see your branding. I see your t-shirt. I see your brown mats at home that you do your online training. I know you, man. I know you better than you can imagine because I see a person that has, I don't want to say OCD, but a finesse to him that likes things a certain way, you know? And I like that. I like to see that about people. I, I don't, I feel, I cringe when I see somebody that doesn't care about the, how the room looks or how their mats look or how their gi looks. I, 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 when I see somebody with a nice clean gi, a nice brand, 
uh, brown mats instead of like the typical whatever color. You know what I mean? Like I look at it like that's a guy I want to talk to. I want to understand why. And and entropy uh, to uh, me is that a little, a little like uh, a little, sorry to interrupt you there. Yes. Uh, the mat, the color of the mats is really uh, my wife's uh, artsy doing. Let's so go, wife. The, uh, <laughs> white or black wouldn't have gone well with the rest of the colors that we have going on here. And she's you know it's uh, important to say that she's the main reason that these mats are here. Nice. Some time ago. Um, uh, some time ago, she was like, well, uh, she, she was spending a lot of time at work, couldn't make it to class uh, in readily on time. And she was like, well, how about we get mats at home and then we can maybe drill like on the off times or the weekends or stuff. Nice. Yeah. And uh, well, she ordered these from Ace Hardware, uh -huh. came in, you know, later. And lo and behold, subhanAllah, we get locked down. Yes. But we have mats. Yes. <laughs> Beautiful mats for video as well to add. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> But, you, you, you know, t tying it uh, to, to, like, my feelings towards what you've set up is I see entropy as, um, I, I mentioned before we even went online that you're a relatable Middle Eastern black belt. And I say sure. that with so much pride to see a Palestinian, Jordanian, uh, Middle Easterner representing us in such a beautiful way that the grown-ups, the older generation can relate to and the young generation can relate to. Entropy is that face to me. As a kid, if I'm, if I'm a kid growing up in Dubai, I'm stylish, I'm hip, I'm cool. I go and I see these old school rah, gyms and stuff. I'll get intimidated. And then uh, I'll see like a beautiful gym like Team Nogueira with like legacy and heritages. I'll still get intimidated. But when I see entropy, I don't feel intimidated. I feel warm. I feel welcome. I see the brand, the color, the feeling, the Instagram. I feel this is the place. And I want to talk to you about how, why, the concept. How did you get there? Dude. It's beautiful. First of all, you just made my day because... That what you just described right now, that feeling that you get when yes. you yes look at the, when you look at the gym and then in, inshallah when you walk through the doors, that's that's what I want. That's what I want to happen in people's minds. So that just fills me up with, uh, with so I'm much. I'm happy because it's fact. It's not flattery. Um. Well, man, uh, I, I I'm gonna tell you all about it, and then you can like stop me when I'm going too far on tangent. Go for but, it. I, I want to hear. <laughs> that's that's why we're here, man. But this started uh, right around the time that I left, um, right around the time that I left UFC gym. And uh, the, the part where I moved the, well, I didn't, but we moved uh, my classes, my training, our training uh, to a different place came from uh, uh, something that you, you know, mentioned early on in our, uh, in, our, uh, in our talk from one of my very old friends, one of my old, like, uh, I dare say, like, you know, one of the strongest and oldest uh, network connections that I made, you know, way back when. So we went uh, to this place in Dubai called World Black Belt Center. It's a, uh, it's a, it's a small uh, karate dojo. Uh, okay. It tanks with a dojo run by uh, Riyadh al -Tai. I don't know if you're familiar with him, but he's a, he, he's a, he, he's a prominent sports figure and he commentates on a lot of the MMA events in the, uh, in the region, okay. along with, Amar, uh, Amar Mutli. Okay. So, uh, and this gentleman, I had met him at this very place. I had trained jujitsu at this very place mm. in 2008 when I was visiting my family in Dubai. <laughs> wow. Seriously, like I was visiting my family in Dubai that time ago. Um, and at that time, you know, another one of my prominent uh, figures and one of my favorite people, and that I personally think you should get in touch with, his name is uh, Eduardo Machado. He was okay. uh, in Jiu Jitsu there at the time. Okay. Um, a lot of uh, other, uh, a lot of other very, very good Jiu Jitsu professors uh, and friends of mine as well. Till this day, were teaching beforehand. And I got to meet them as well at mm. the time. They were Olavo Abriu and uh, Suyan Kiroz. Uh, these gentlemen, I got to attend some of their classes, but the mm -hmm. bulk of my time there, when I was visiting family and spending time on the mats, mm -hmm. uh, was with. Um, so like, that's where I met uh, Riyad, or his, his, uh, he's more affectionately known as Rio. We call him Rio. Nice, nice nickname. And, yeah, well, I thought so too. <laughs> uh, and so I, was, I would always in touch, be in touch with uh, Rio, you know, when I travel back to the States, when, you know, I'd be visiting back in town. Yes. Uh, he'd allow me to like, come train on like a very uh, flexible pro-rated uh, basis because I would not be in town for a consistent like period. So I wouldn't have like a, a membership, so to speak. I'd mm -hmm. be in town for like, two and a half weeks or something okay. so uh around that time where i you know we we left uh, i left ufc gym 
uh, I gave a call to uh, to Rio and I go, hey man, do you have uh, jujitsu classes or you still have that same place? He's like, yep, it's still here. I go, do you have uh, jujitsu classes? He goes, no, no, we're, we're open. Would you like to come teach? Um, I said, well, um, well, if I if I did, when when can I uh, possibly take time slots? He's like, you can start from tomorrow. Wow. And so tomorrow is where we started. Like I left uh, uh, the my last day at uh, UFC gym was October third. It was a uh-huh. Monday. October fourth, we had our first session uh, over there at uh, World Black Belt Center, and I still have that that picture to this day. It was Unbelievable. People. And w- were you in touch with Rio throughout those years, or did it like reignite yeah. in that time? Yeah, yeah, briskly, like you know, as as you would with uh, friends who live across the world, right? Like, sure, sure. Uh, happy- messages like every now and again like hey how you doing how's the place doing how's how's everything how's family um but nothing like uh, nothing as uh, not as close as like i would say like a a best friend um but a very acquaintance and uh, he he, quite a bit just by giving us that uh uh, that opportunity to go amazing Uh, shout out to rio oh man heavy heavy shout out to rio and um you know i i want to say that 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 place gave birth to some of the you know some of the biggest, uh, you know, jujitsu and martial arts schools and institutions that you see in the, the country now. Because at one point, many of them were training there, learning there as white belts, and blue belts, and now you see them, you know, as black belts teaching and or like MMA fighters competing. So it's 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 unbelievable. Uh, Tam Khan, I'm I'm sure you're yes. familiar with him. Yes, he used to train there. <laughs> yep. Um, good to know. Good to know. And Rio himself is like uh, he's a he does jujitsu, but uh, he does it sparingly because most of the time is spent teaching uh thanks to do and he does okay. it under hoist he's a purple belt now hmm, okay uh, yeah interesting point fact of information so um cool. again back to, back to entropy and my me and my tangents um we were there uh training day in and day out and i i quickly saw the potential uh that i could have with my team not just you know the potential but the um the vision that i had for our team was not limited um in a certain or confined to a certain amount of space, mm-hmm. right? Like Rio is gracious enough to share his mats uh, with us for yes. certain times of the, um, you know, of course we, I, me and my students would help clean the mats. Uh, mm-hmm. We take care of the best of our ability, but very soon uh, we grew out of that. We, we grew out of that space. We were just too many um, uh, for that place. Not just from a, uh, you know, not just from a space a standpoint, but from a, you know, sustaining the dojo kind of standpoint. Wow. How um, many like people approximately? I think my biggest class in that space, and it was not a very big space. I'll show you pictures uh, later. Uh, my biggest class there was a good thirty people, Whoa. and it was a it was a it was stacked mats. I'm talking like you see steam all over the mirrors and <laughs> the best kind of training. Uh, we had we had we had I think fifty total between the adults and the kids. Uh, Amazing. Before, by by the end of our, I guess I would say our time at Black Belt Center. Rio must have been but, like, this is the taking over. <laughs> well, I mean, it was also, it was also, I wanted to be, you know, a bit considerate to Rio himself. Sure. Right. We were spending a lot of time there and, you know, sure. he probably want to have his dojo uh, in a certain way. And I respected of that, course, right? Because of if course. he was in my house, I would like things uh, done and run a certain way. Sure. Um, so, uh, but then the, the idea of it, I knew it had to start with, with something, yes. the idea I've always, it, well, not always, it, it, it was at that breakthrough point of my life, mm-hmm. um, that I'm going to talk to you about still, um, that I decided that I want to do like jujitsu is going to be my thing. It's going to be my bread and butter. It's going to be what I'm going to grow and become the best version of myself doing. Okay. And it, was, it became a dream of mine, you know, it blossomed in my head to have my own academy. I didn't know where, I didn't know how. Uh, at that time, the idea came about, it was in the States. So I didn't even let go of that when I was working at UFC gym. I just knew that like, it, it was going to happen some way, somehow, somewhere, you know? Oh, okay. And I knew it had to start with an idea. Like I can't just build an academy without having it built around a, a mission, a vision, and of course, a name. And mm-hmm. I needed something, uh, not only that, uh, that is catchy and, you know, you can get people to, you know, say it and Stand like behind. it. But it has to mean something for me, right? Mm-hmm. It, and that's and that's something I don't know if other people do that to their you know, academies or their businesses. Mm-hmm. But I need it to mean something for me. If I'm pick a name for my business, for my enterprise, for my dream, I need it to have a big meaning for me. True. Um, 
And here I was like scrabbling, like brainstorming on a piece of paper, uh, you know, all sorts of names, hints, like things that are meaningful to me um, that I that could be catchy as a name that could rhyme, chime well with jujitsu. Mm -hmm. um, and I remembered um, a word that I really, really liked and I came across in uh, engineering school, actually. And that, wor that word was entropy. Okay. And so I, I, I was like, man, that, that's it. Like, as soon as I thought about it, as soon as I remembered it, I was like, that's it. It clicks. So I, I wrote it down and I, I remembered everything about that, you know, about that term uh, that I, that really attracted me and that ca caused me to remember it. It's, uh, this is this next 30 seconds, guys, as a disclaimer, it's a very, very nerdy section of the podcast. Go for it, man. Go for it. We're nerds geeking out on uh, jiu-jitsu, bro. Good, but the listeners might not be. <laughs> um, so uh, entropy uh, is a concept. It's a concept in uh, physics or in thermodynamics, to be specific. Okay. It goes, uh, it's one of the laws of thermodynamics and it, 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 the law of entropy. It states that a system will continue to grow in chaos or in disorder. Okay, continuously until it reaches a state of balance, state of equilibrium. And then after it reaches that state of balance, the cycle starts all over again. You're part of a much bigger system and a balance, wow. and you start going into bigger, bigger, bigger. Uh, okay, well, bigger is sort of like a framework, but really, you get my gist here. Like, so think of like a, sm a, a big thing of smoke that all of a sudden becomes like a, a solid square and it starts yes. to grow again. It fills again. the space. Yes, exactly. Exactly. The never ending space. So it's like a, a never ending cycle of growth, wow. so to speak. Wow. And for me, I thought about it very long and hard. And I was like, for me, that's, that's jujitsu. You know, you come into jujitsu thinking Beautiful. this is just crazy. This is insane. This is like, you can't make one and two together. You think back to your white belt days, if you will, uh, how much sense could you make out of one class and the next? None. Not, <laughs> not all Right. And then as soon as you progress and progress and progress, and you get to the, that point where you think you got it all, figured out balance right you get to the next belt like oh amazing blue belt i got this you go to the blue belt class and the the higher belts they just tear you up and you're like man i thought i had this figured out okay back to chaos again <laughs> exactly so relearn, relearn relearn so yes like, and again, as soon as you get to another level and the other level i mean it's a never ending for me it's a never ending process of, of growth of learning mm -hmm. and of uh, a strive for that equilibrium and for me that equilibrium is is my best self and you know because we're we're uh, the best version of myself the best version of, of you of anybody that comes through the doors and wants to, to learn jujitsu yes um but for me that you know we're imperfect uh, beings as humans and uh, but that does not mean that you can't strive for your best self absolutely you know, I, I, i'm always always chasing that best version of myself and that best version of me right now is me five years, 10 years uh, down the line. You know, I'm, I'm chasing that, that, that person uh, who's going to have a comp who's going to have accomplished those things uh, that I haven't accomplished yet. I'm constantly chasing that person day in and day out and day in and day out. And that's why, that's why entropy uh, became the name for me because it means so much to me. And yes. it's only when I explain all of this to people that are like, Oh man, that makes sense. But, uh, it's great, but and then you know, I meant I wanted it to just look good and have people uh, put it on. Sure, on YouTube sure. And everything and and I sought um, I sought the help of one of my uh, friends and brothers, uh, Evan Manweiler. He's a jujitsu black belt as well, uh, okay. Atos black belt, so mm -hmm. under Galvao. and uh, he's an amazing, amazing uh, designer and artist. Clearly, and. He worked on, well, he worked on a lot of the uh, the artwork uh, that you that you potentially see these days he works with a lot of gi companies to design gis like, yes you know design with gis so you probably see uh, some of his designs here and there and i knew how good he was he made flyers for seminars that i've seen before mm. and i love the guy to death and you know we're, we're very close your branding is fantastic this is his work as well yeah wow so i'm like this 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 i want i want it to look good i want this is the concept this is what it means yes I wanted at that time I didn't know exactly you know how I wanted it to be but I was like here go crazy and he just went creative he went Amazing. all out he gave me options and he goes I think this one is the best because you can replicate it into merchandise into geese into no geese and you run right here it's just like a stamp that you you just put everywhere and I attribute like he made this design and if you look closely if you look at it from a distance and you see mm -hmm. that yeah 
look at it from a distance, it doesn't look like anything at all. Yeah, absolutely. It doesn't look like anything at all. It just looks like a big mess. A then you start up. to look at it and you see like, oh, then you Ent can put out that it spells entropy, but in a weird, chaotic kind of way. So it's like order within Fits disorder. Fits perfectly. Man, oh my God. This, what like a beautiful, Evan, beautiful name. <laughs> wow, what a guy, man. Like, listen, it, it's... It's unbelievable. There's so much behind it. Like the depth is an ocean. <laughs> Man, I'm telling you. And then I, the moment that, I, you know, I, we got to that point and it was breakthrough after breakthrough. I was like, Evan, put it on a gi for me. I want to wow. see it. Wow. And this was like a year, a year and a half, maybe like two years, dare, dare I say, before we even, you know, opened the gym or like got even to that point. And okay. I had the picture. I had the logo. I had it on my phone since then. I had the picture of the logo on T-shirts. and all You lived it. And and i'm like man we're gonna wear this and we're gonna wear it in the best way possible and then i mean you know things just started to happen when it came when the time came for us to you know to make that move i started to look for a place yeah um and that was like a huge struggle in and of itself because you I'm, you know absolutely imagine looking for an apartment but then like it's like a much bigger level of uh of stress because it has to fit not only you and your liking but everybody else's absolutely. has to have like a out so that you can plan and design your uh, your system how people walk in what do they see and i started to just visualize that day in and day out day in and day out um the design for the gym was actually uh done by a very close friend of mine and one of the most prominent female jujitsu black belts in the region uh, uh -huh. Nama Kubba, if you've heard of Nama. yes of course an absolute rock star as a jujitsu practitioner and as an architect so she's she's the one who designed the uh, the gym your gym is born and bred in jujitsu. The design, you, Lama, like it's a, holy shit, man. It's a product of jujitsu. The color scheme, she's like, What colors do you want? I'm like, I want white mats. Mm -hmm. You can do this. Like, I literally just said that. Like, I know I wanted white mats. Yes. And you, like the rest has to just fit in also nicely. So we worked together on that. And, you know, it was a very uh, lengthy and time consuming project. But, you know, as, uh, as the saying goes, you know, uh, good uh, good things take time to go yes, through they right do. yes they do i mean the takes through you know those things are really really worth it and i'm just happy and blessed and thankful that uh I was, like god gave me the the strength and the and the perseverance uh you know the faith in, to go through this process and give me the support system to sort of make it to where we are today because it's not me it's never been just me i've just been the catalyst you know i maybe sure. i brought people together in one place but you know they lifted me up on a lot of occasions that they don't know about mm -hmm. um a lot of days that were really really challenging for me uh they lifted me up they reminded me of why uh part of the reason why i do this of you know the end goal the end game is the dream come true is for us to have you know a place of our own where we can mm -hmm. train and share that place with right. everybody who's walked through the door be coachable teachable right and you know embrace you know what we have to offer is i want everybody walking through the door okay to become the best version of themselves mentally physically spiritually emotionally and what a beautiful story that is by far the most exciting refreshing and beautiful story of a jiu-jitsu project uh, a, a jiu-jitsu dream come true that i've ever heard honestly and and like i salute you so much on if people need to hear this, I don't know, Mike, I'm sure you talk. Uh, I have heard your talks after classes. They're very inspirational. That's why I call you the inspiration without even meeting you. But I hope people hear this because, and they will, I'm going to make sure they fucking do. <laughs> but <laughs> my God, man, the amount of effort and consideration you've put into this project is crazy. Like I, I feel already taken care of before even stepping in your gym. That's like... That is what more. people need to see. That is what we need more of in the region. It's, it's one of those things, man, where, again, the quote that we both like, rising tide raises all boats. Somebody has to lead the front and pioneer it in a certain direction. Doesn't mean he's the pioneer of the entire ship. It doesn't mean he's the captain of the entire sea. We don't have to look at it that way. He's a ship on the sea sailing in an uncharted territory. And once he charts that territory, other people can pursue dreams in that territory too. It's not. And you, I feel, have to... You have charted a territory that the Middle East has not yet charted and showed what's possible when a passion project meets friends within the same passion and creates this like this brainchild that is entropy. It's exciting, man. It's it's fantastic. I salute you. I commend you and I applaud you guys, all of you that were involved with this project on what you're doing. Now, 
talking to people on social media, um, there was a, uh, you know, Majid Khalaf? I do know him. I've met him. Uh, he came to train with us once and what a stand up guy. I love this guy. Yes. So Ma Majid Khalaf is somebody I connected with through Jiu Jitsu. The first time I met him was us fighting against each other in a competition. Um, oh, well, okay. So, um, and, and since then, we, we clicked on a note and we trained together privately, me and him on the mats, once, twice a week, just to touch base and help each other out in our games. He's somebody yeah. that I, I lean on for objectivity. He, he cuts a lot okay. of bullshit and he talks. When, I, when he knew that I'm interviewing you, he sent me a message, so a shout out to him, thank you for this. He said, if there is one thing that I really admire about Tahir is his ability to create culture. Hmm. Because well, in, in an organization, in a business, you've, you've, you've mastered in, in business. I've like, this is the most repeated topic in business. It's if you can create a solid, strong culture, that's one right. of the major keys to success. And you have pioneered, if I was to call it the chartered territory, what I'm talking about is culture in a gym. Yeah. Uh, your gym is very inviting. You have a very balanced diversity in culture, in gender, in age. Um, what do you think is the ingredient? What is, it, what is it that makes the entropy culture entropy? Man, that's, that's, a, that's a, the crux, actually, of, uh, of my mission and our mission, really. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, always, I learned this uh, from being part of different academies, from following uh, many people I consider leaders and mentors and, and inspirational figures, mm -hmm. that in order to create or in order to create something, something, whatever you want to create, right? You, first of all, you have to, you have to believe, you have to believe it, right? It, you know, you're first, you're the first person that has to be in full conviction yes. of what you want to body and you want to create. That's something that I treat. And the next part is that you have to lead from the front. Mm. You know, I've seen many organizations and teams and businesses and they, I, I don't want to say fail, but they struggle quite a bit uh, mm -hmm. because, the, because the leadership does not embody those concepts and those principles mm -hmm. that they want to see in everybody else. Mm -hmm. And so I knew very early on, like whatever I wanted to see out there, I wanted to have full conviction of and I needed to embody it myself. Yes. Everything, everything from, from the moment people walk through the door until they leave, I make sure that... I treat it with the utmost respect and integrity, and I do it. Uh, I, I I dare say, you know, my I I I do it to the best of my ability, to the best of you know my uh, my integrity, the my best possible way. You know, I I'm very strict with certain things, and I like things done a certain way. Um, not because I'm not because I'm OCD. I like yeah. I kind of use that, and I hunch back on that. I piggyback on that because I. I truly want the people to have the best possible experience that they can. And I, 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 along the process, I thought of every single thing that I think about walking to the gym, you know, not just, you know, for me sitting down and like envisioning it, but I go to, you know, I cross train. Like when I was in the States, I'd go to like my friends' academies and we'd like we'd do open mat sessions together. And I'd remember how I felt walking through different places, yes. you know, stuff on the mats, being on the mats, uh, getting off the mats, going into the bathrooms, uh, showers, if they, if they had them, and then packing my mm -hmm. stuff and leaving. Every mm -hmm. single bit of that has to have an element of what you want, want to embody. To represent right? you. Exactly, 100%. 100% and to represent what you want to create. You want everybody to feel at home. Yes. Which also means the people there have to buy into that. Okay, and that sometimes becomes a bit of a, uh, you know, an interesting uh, struggle because people come to jujitsu for different reasons. Not everybody's there for the same reason. People maybe yes. have, uh, some people have a chip on their shoulder. Um, some people come from uh, these gyms that may be like, may have like a bit of an intimidating uh, mm -hmm. culture, a fighting culture, etc. Like, you know, all sorts of walks of life. People walk through the gym and I make sure uh, that, you know, no matter where people come from, that, you know, they either are infected, if that's an okay word to use these days, they're infected with the... the, the, <laughs> the <positive> <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, I get you. What an age we live in, bro. <laughs> Seriously, man, like, I can't even use that word without, like, cringing for a second. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so they come infected. I want, I want them to... I, I want them to... It's kind of like, 
think of it like walking into a, a room and smelling like a really nice fragrance or perfume. Mm -hmm. Think of it that way. And then, you know, the rest of it kind of just falls into place. It's like a domino effect. And each step like builds on the next. The senses. That's, that's mm -hmm. really right. Exactly. That's really how I envisioned it from you walking in and seeing the different, you know, welcoming elements, the, uh, the color palettes, mm -hmm. um, the people greeting you at every single point of entry, whether it's, you know, it's not just the, uh, one of my students uh, is manning the front desk. Her name is Aya. She's uh, one of the mm -hmm. sweetest people. Um, and, uh, whether it's people welcoming you as you walk in, they're sitting at mm -hmm. the front desk or people just being on the mats. If they see that you're new and they haven't seen you before, they welcome you as, you know, just like amazing. a long lost cousin or brother that they haven't seen in a very long time. Oh, what are you doing? Oh, amazing. You're here for jujitsu. Wonderful. Because, that's how I did it to them. Yes. And this is what I want to get to. Like that's, that's how I treated them the first day that they came in. Beautiful. And that's how I treat them every single day. Cause every single day is a learning opportunity. Every single day yes. is a chance for us to be together and grow together uh, on the mats. And mm -hmm. I treat it as such. I treat yes. everybody. I, try, I, I do my very best. Like sometimes, some days and maybe I'll fall, fall short, but mm -hmm. I do my best treat everybody with that you know, with that welcoming attitude and with that, you know, uh, teacher attitude that uh, I try to be the most patient person I can be because I know, mm -hmm. you know, teach it, learning is a difficult process. And for some people, it's more difficult than others. And that's a particular thing that I'm very, very careful to, you know, handle with care because mm -hmm. you might rub off on people the wrong way yes. if you, you have the wrong kind of attitude towards it. And, you know, everything comes uh, from within. I always yes. tell my guys, like, if you want to make a huge, huge, huge change, look here. That's mm -hmm. where it starts. Mm -hmm. starts from you and then it spreads to everybody else so if you're not feeling uh, if you're feeling uh let's say uh particularly uh depressed or not very happy or etc and you're we're so worried about your family uh not being happy with their lives i'm like man you you got to start with you first mm -hmm. right you start with you and then it just spreads out it just yes. spreads out and you know, being a, you know happiness positivity and that good energy it's so much more infectious and yes. it's so much better than the, there's that word again, it's so much better than the negative stuff. Right? Yes. Um, so, you know, that's, that's how I think about it. That's how I think about creating our culture. And I think about everybody buying into that culture so that we can become the best team we possibly can be. That's how it started. Zin. And then yeah. once you get to a certain point or a certain amount of people in the team mm -hmm. that embody the same beliefs that you do or that I do, yes. um, uh, then the, the the amount of work or daily work, so to speak, that I have to put in towards it, uh, I don't want to say diminishes, but like it's like I have people helping me to do it. Not yes. like it is. Yes. They're all like helping me to do it. There's that tide raising everybody up. You again, created a family. Yes. Exactly. We're a family. We're not. It's not a. You know. Uh, it's not a gym. I like yes. to call it first of all a, a training facility or uh, an academy because mm -hmm. you know we're there to train and we're there to learn. So yes. those are the two terms that i use mm -hmm. and they're to help each other because you know your your most valuable asset on the mats is your training partner no matter yes. what you may think it's your training partner yes. and if you take your training partner uh, they'll take care of you there's there's going to be a time when you're going to need somebody to you know help you stand back up or help you push that extra mile extra minute in training extra minute in a fight in you know in in life and whatever you may have and you'll be surprised how those people show up every single time and you least expect it, but you have to build it the right way, or at least the way that you want. And that's the way, oh, sorry. That's mm -hmm. the way that, uh, that I want, uh, yeah. my family, uh, to be not just, you know, uh, absolutely. My... absolutely, man. I, I hear you on what yeah, you're saying and, and it makes sense why, why you've built this culture. Like there's a resounding message from what you said, which is, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah I can hear you. I'm just okay. plugging in this, this uh, tablet. Uh, it flew back from the weight of what you said. <laughs> it was it was so deep and and, and powerful. <laughs> yeah, that's so, awesome. I'm, I'm, ha I'm happy. I mean, uh, I'm I'm always I'm always conscious about um, you know. I'm always conscious about the way that I uh, deliver uh, my message, like any sort of message, whether it be like a I know a technique uh, in or uh, you know or or a thought that comes through. I mm -hmm. mean, maybe it came from, uh, from way back in, in engineering. Like I always, even back then, I always mm -hmm. like to help people. Um, yes. you know, if they need help, you know, people came to me, like, even for a simple, like, Oh, can you help me understand this concept or that concept or do homework or study for an exam? I gladly do it. And, mm -hmm. and I noticed sometime down the road that, you know, helping people learn is mm -hmm. like learning it 
all over again, even if it's something that I already know very well. Yes. It's like learning it all over again. And mm -hmm. that's something that even, I didn't even know it was possible until I started teaching jujitsu at, uh, at the Purdue uh, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu Club. Sure. And then, and then again in Dubai, when I had to design my own program, mm -hmm. because I had to break it down for people that have mm -hmm. never, some of them have never even heard of jujitsu before. Right. Right. And there goes the, the cliche way uh, that uh, that teachers uh, used to use uh, for me. I don't know for you, but they used to use for us in in school, in you know, in preschool, in middle, not preschool, in middle school, high school, and then again in college. Can you explain it to a five year old? Mm, okay. Explain something to a five year old, then you understand it. And so I thought yes. to myself, I'm going to break this down in the simplest way possible, using simple terms. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, make it a fun learning experience for them. Not everything has to be boring and mundane. Absolutely. Okay? For sure, I would enjoy it if it was. I would enjoy teaching if that was the case. And I, that's something that I also picked up from some of, uh, some of the teachers that I had in engineering. Like some pe there was a guy uh, who taught me, what was the course? Fluid mechanics. Mm. You know, the name, the name just sounds difficult, mm -hmm. right? But, and I kid you not, that course was a killer. It was an mm. absolute killer. But the guy, he just enjoyed teaching. He enjoyed being a professor so much that I, you know, briefly for a period of few months, I actually considered doing my PhD and becoming a professor. Wow. Uh, at, not not that thing particularly, but, you know, he enjoyed it so much and he shared all that with us. Yes. He embodied it. So well. I'm like, man, if he can do that to, to that. To, to that. With like, dynamics. It, it doesn't have to be that. Exactly, right? man. Uh, and who knew back, who knew, like fast forward a few years down the road that I would be, you know, a, a professor in jujitsu. And it, it's just. And incredible. taking note of that professor's impact on you with oh, a totally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I remember him to this day. Guys, guys, amazing. Like he, he would. Yeah. yeah. You know, Th Th Thabit, it's, um, it's amazing what you're saying about the impact that a first interaction can set a tone on the future with the culture, with the people that come into your place. So because. You see a lot of gyms uh, around the world in jiu-jitsu. I've, I've gotten exposed to a lot and I've seen a lot of videos. So you see the gyms where the coach, the master, is a tough MMA background guy. So you can only yeah. imagine how the first experience would be. The first experience would be probably he wouldn't even look at you when you step into the mat. He would probably make you feel not worthy of his time. And then you would naturally go into this mind frame where I need to gain his, his appreciation or his uh, attention, or you would just completely get, reject it. But it shapes your personality. A lot of people have, like what I believe, primary, secondary, and tertiary uh, inner core beliefs, right? Uh, yeah. Or attributes to them. The primary don't change that much. The secondary take close people to them. The third level, I think this is where people like you can impact a lot of people because they're vulnerable. When they, they, they go on Google, BJJ Gym, they find entropy, and then they drive to you, they get to you, they've done so much and you've done nothing yet when it comes to this right. relationship, right? They've taken so much risk with zero risk to you in, in that sense. So for yeah. them, when they step in, they've already given you their cards. I'm here, I don't have a gym, I'm looking for a place to train. They've given you so much, right? So when you feel vulnerable, that's when the third level of your personal inner core beliefs is manipulated, All right? Let's talk psychology. I'm a big student of psychology, so. How about it? Uh, so them coming in and experiencing, that is the time for anybody listening that, that thinks of the impact it has, why their team has a culture that it has or doesn't have a culture, is that first experience when people come in, when a new person comes into your gym, what huh? is it that happens to them that makes them become part of your culture or reject it? Another thing I know about entropy is how you value a new person as a culture. When they come in, how you treat them at the end of the class, how you show appreciation them for them. Man, like you, you check all the boxes of safety. The, the number yeah. one human requirement is not money, is not food, is nothing. It's safety. With safety comes food and water and family and, and good and everything. So you're when, we're, when we're walking on the right, you want to feel safe and you embody that with entropy and what you're saying to me. Absolutely, man. Absolutely. I mean, it's, 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 it, I'm, I'm going to build on a little bit of the things that you said. Like if somebody makes that, that investment, right, yes. makes that trip, they, they, they do their research, they, you know, maybe they go and visit like multiple. Also, also, uh, audio, your audio just cut. I'm 
I'm glad I was visually able to stop him. Hello? He, yeah, there we go. Okay, cool. So okay, it, we, somebody took no, that same. risk and they came all the way yeah. to you. Yes. They took that risk. They made that investment and they actually made it to the front door of the academy. Okay. I haven't done mm -hmm. anything yet. They made it to the mm -hmm. front door of the academy. Mm -hmm. They're, they ha they're going to they're gonna come in and train with us. At the very, very least, yes. I'm going to make sure they put on a gi and they come and train with us. They're there, they're there, okay? yes. I'll do whatever I can to make sure that these people get on the mats and they get the full experience of actually being there. Mm -hmm. Okay? So, I mean, that, that, so that's part of where the other stuff comes from, a part of building that culture, is that, hey, you made it here. I'm going to make sure you have a great time. I'm going to make sure that, at, that you walk out of this place feeling at least 10 times better than when you walked in. I, I love that mentality. And that's the mindset I think that'll get you really far because, you know, Thabit, uh, th there was other things that people wanted to hear from you and questions, some controversial, some not. You know, we have some mashkalji <laughs> in our community that like to yeah. get questions. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy if I have... <laughs> Majid, I'm looking at you again. So, uh, <laughs> uh, so the thing is, we were, I wanted to touch up on when it comes to the lineage and when it comes to who people prefer to learn from because we have this stigma or this mentality in the Middle East, whereas I'm a person that, um, like, I live in the Middle East. The Middle East hasn't yet gotten to this really refined stage of jujitsu, So they have this belief for some reason that I should get it from the source. I should get it from this lineage. And, and then they flock to seeing senior black belt Brazilian jiu-jitsu athletes that are living here in the UAE. Like, we're spoiled for choice, if you think about it. Uh, and they're like, why would I go to a local gym uh, with a Middle Easterner coach when I can go and probably learn under these black belts? And I was, there's almost no point of me asking you that because everything you said answered that to me. And I think it already answered it to the people listening. The coaches here are fantastic. The culture is fantastic. There's no doubt about that. And you're getting like the Cristiano Ronaldo's of, of uh, BGJ. You're a Messi, <laughs> you know, it's not like you, you're, you're a Cristiano Ronaldo yourself, like you're playing on the big leagues and not in the sense, like there's ways of playing in the big leagues in different ways. Like look at John Danaher. Did we ever hear yeah. his name in competitions? Did he ever win any major yeah. battles that we know of? Nothing, yeah. right? He became what he is because of this mindset that he has, right? And you have a mindset which is worthy of people flocking to and learning from because it can rub off on people. And that's simply my answer. I don't need your explanation at all. I would like to hear what you think about it in the region. But for me personally, Thabit, I'm sold. I don't need to hear it. But in your opinion, where do we see this shift where uh, we have the talent that is at the same level as the Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu black belts here? First of all, man, thank you so much for your kind words. I mean, I, I'm just humbled. Honestly. From the heart. Uh, Absolutely from the heart. I really, really appreciate it. Um, uh, look, there, there are a few things here uh, to mention and to talk about. Okay. Um, but I'm going to start with, some, with a very, very, very simple concept that I think people, um, they, don't, they don't really fully comprehend and understand it. Uh, my whole take on it is if somebody's out there and they can give you a better experience as, as an athlete, as, an, as a jiu-jitsu practitioner, as a teammate, as a person, um, then by all means, go to them. Like not every, like I don't claim that I'm the best teacher for everybody or that I'm the best you know, team leader or instructor uh, for everybody. I don't claim that. Right. I know that different people respond to different energies or different, uh, you know, ways of communication or, or, or stigmas or like I a set of, set of rules and regulations, right? Different people respond to that differently. And uh, I always said to my guys, like I said it very, very on, like from the very first moment that I started teaching in Dubai, I said, uh, I highly encourage cross training because if you find that, you know, if you find a person uh, that you think uh, can teach you better than I do and mm -hmm. you start to feel about being here i highly encourage you to have a conversation with me and you know to try it like try it out like i'm not going to be that person that's going to stop you from being the best person you can be right whether that's in or in life right mm -hmm. and that's uh, so, so that's one thing that's that's part of it yeah. and then the other part of it is you need to understand that this is uh this is the 21st century this is not the the 1980s or the 1990s right yeah. jujitsu 
started in Brazil and I have a huge, huge level of admiration and respect for the people who paved the way for the rest of us and for the OGs, the, the, the original uh, jujitsu guys who started in Brazil and like some of them are doing amazing things these days. Um, but I also maintain and, and I stress that anybody can learn to be great at jujitsu and anybody can learn to be a good teacher, a good leader, a good mentor, a good teammate, a good athlete. And that, that doesn't necessarily have to come from there. If, if jujitsu works the way we want it to work, mm -hmm. you know, if, if the truth is that we are all a community mm -hmm. together mm -hmm. right? and the information is so readily available out there, like some people can, you know, train up to, up to, I don't know, blue and purple belt just by like drilling together at home and watching YouTube videos these days. Right. Um, there's so much content information out there. You don't have to necessarily get it from one particular source. And I'm not saying that in any way, like no Very nice point. whatsoever. Um, you I know, know uh, information is unreal. Uh, so you go to wherever you think you can receive that information and assimilate mm -hmm. it the mm -hmm. best way you possibly can. Right. I don't mm -hmm. claim uh, that I'm the best, but I, I definitely am on a constant effort to be the best person that I can be. Clearly. Right? I always, Guys, I'm not the best. I just try my best. I just do my best every single day, every single breath that I, that I take. I, you know, I pray God gives me years and years and years to do this and impact people's lives. I do it to the best of my capability. You know, if that's something that you're okay with and you know, you want to be a part of, yes. you know, I'll give you my all from the day that you walk in till the day that you, you know, uh, they, you choose to leave for whatever reason that may be, I'll give you my all because that's just me. It's not yes. because, you know, I'm, that's not because I'm gambling for something more that I want something more out of you or you or you or you. Uh, that's because, you know, springing from me from within, you know, that's mm -hmm. part of my, uh, that's part of my journey. That's part of my self-discovery, you know, for to be the best person that I can be. Right. And I can't be that person. And if I, if I give people double standards yes. on it, yes, it wouldn't feel, it wouldn't feel right. And, and, and honestly, like it'd be, it'd be fake and people could, people not could, they would see through it. Right. Like, I have, I, I have a firm belief that, you know, if, if you're, if you're two-faced about something, and sorry for that yeah. wrong, not wrong. No, that, not that at all. Of, uh, if you're two-faced about something and sooner or later, the truth will come out. And jujitsu yes. or that is one of those places, one of those very few places where your true colors will show. Yes. And it doesn't take that much time. Let's roll. You'll see the true color of a person when you roll with them or when you see them rolling. So, um, sorry, sorry I took so long to talk about no, this, but it's not at all. That, very, very true and very dear to me, right? Mm -hmm. I don't have to learn from a particular source. Mm -hmm. I have to learn and I have to make sure that I do it in the best way uh, mm -hmm. humanly possible and I achieve the best possible self. Like that's, that's part of the reason why uh, I'm in the position that I am today because I sought out people who can help me get, the, get to the best building, the best version of myself. Part of the reason why I, I, I trained my brother Carlos for so many years, I could have chosen yep. not to, right? Yep. That's part of why when I went to Kurt O.C. Anders gym and like blue and purple belts beat me up as a brown belt, I stayed there, right? It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's very, it's, it was a very humbling experience and it was not easy for sure. But I knew that, you know, given time and time and practice, mm -hmm. okay, if you're, I told myself back then, if, if I'm the best person in the room, I'm in the wrong room. Mm. I like that. So I, that. I needed that influence. That's why, you know, I saw, so uh, well, I didn't seek out but that's why uh, you know uh, I, I sought out the you know the the teaching and the mentorship and the leadership of Andre Galvao and, uh, and, and the Atos team because mm -hmm. you know it, it helped push me it helped bring out like a different a different layer that was mm -hmm. just hidden down about onions well that's a different layer that you know you know it couldn't just get to that point just yet mm -hmm. uh, uh, another uh, another element of this is the element of the competing uh, accomplished uh, black belt, that, that image, that persona yes. of uh, that achieves like, oh, well, uh, you are a world champion. Well, how many world titles? Well, okay, great. Like I, I, I am all for that. And I'm personally on a quest uh, mm -hmm. to become a world champion and not just once, multiple times. And I, you know, I pray that God gives me years and strength, you know, to, to achieve. That is one of my targets, one of my goals. It's not just for me, but for, the, for my team, for my family for my yes. country, like for everything that I've built and worked hard for. Um, but make no mistake that I'm not going to do that so I can hang it up uh, on the wall and for people to look at that and use that as something 
to tell whether or not I'm good at what I do. And what mm -hmm. I do, this place in this white matted academy is teach. Beautiful right? message. So I, if you, uh, uh, like, I'm not saying that they're mutually exclusive. Like you could be the best competitor in the world Absolutely. and an amazing Muzzle Absolutely. Talk, great, awesome. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. It doesn't have to be the case. Absolutely. I, I, man, I, I completely understand what you're saying. And I love the, that comparison you did, which is the, the attitude and the mentality that a competitor and a person who's a world champion is at the caliber that you should seek out to learn from. Because sometimes they end up being not very good teachers, <laughs> right? Like sometimes a great competitor doesn't mean he's going to be a good teacher. He's been so focused on beating the shit out of people. Maybe he doesn't really want to be around people, you know? But you have, you have vivid examples of that in the competition scene. Yes. You see, like there are some of the people with the most world titles that cannot teach. So true. So true. I've seen that firsthand and I understand. But that's the thing. It's like jujitsu. It's not that they can't teach. It's that they didn't spend time teaching or commit to it. It's just like jujitsu. You didn't spend time committing on the mat. You're not going to get that good. So that's it. Um, but but Thabit, you know, like what you're saying about uh, this this whole mindset and the reason I wanted to talk about this topic of people choosing places and clubs and teams and us versus them comes almost at the core as well of this podcast. And the message that I want to shoot out to people through the people that I meet is we're a community, right? And we lose far more than we gain by staying within our own four walls, our echo chamber, right? Mm -hmm. We have to reach out, interact with each other, seek information from each other and treat each other as not, not opponents. It's cool. Competition is beautiful to refine jujitsu. Treat them as opponents. Beat your opponent in the match. Go for the gold. Good job. But when it's all said and done, we're just a jujitsu community. We're a bunch of guys, geeks, tough guys, whatever, that got humbled, that got lifted by the same art. So I, I, like, when I thought this is a lot of people don't understand the core of this podcast or might not understand where I'm going. Some people see these a million podcasts popping up now in quarantine. Everybody's doing it. It's for me, pure and simple. I see a region with booming talent, with incredible, incredible like opportunities for so many people. But I want to see it mature as a community, not as individuals. I want to see us all raise each other. When we have one person growing from the UAE, like Omar, uh, Omar Al-Fadli, I interviewed on my podcast, a young Emirati competitor, driven, Ciao. passionate. We should all, from all corners of the Middle East, be behind this guy because when he rises, we all rise together. When a person like you opens a gym like Entropy and starts representing the Middle East, Palestine, Urdun, uh, th this new generation of people that went to the U.S., brought that culture back home, we should be all behind you in that. It's not teams. Who gives a shit? In the large scale of things, when we're all old and we've got kids and we've got this whole team mentality and brands and logos doesn't mean shit. It's the friends and the people relations you have, you know? Um... I, I, I just, I'm so happy we did this. I'm so happy we sat down and, and got this message out that you have. It's a beautiful message, bro. Thank you so much, man. I is truly, truly, a, you know, uh, another ex growth experience for me as, you know, I, I get to, well. thank you so much, man. Like, I get to, uh, I get to share like a little bit, like bits and pieces of my story and my experiences with, you know, um, you know, even with my wife, like if I sat her for two and a half hours to <laughs> talk about this, you'd be like, okay, pick this up later. <laughs> I know, I know. Like, with my family, like, uh, I, I never get to say it that way. I never get to converse with somebody on that level. So I truly thank you for this, uh, for that opportunity. For It is absolutely an honor for me, man. And, and I can't wait. I want this pandemic to end. I can't wait till the many times we will hang out, come by Dubai. I want to train at your gym. I want to, I want to get that t-shirt you got, man. It looks good. I'm looking at that t-shirt. Yeah, I'm, com I'm coming for it. I'm coming for it, man. I love the brand. I love the I'm message that you it. deliver. <laughs> <laughs> We're coming, man. Just, just before, I don't want to take so much more of your time, but I have to ask you this because you're an ambitious guy. You're driven. You've got so much going on. What can we expect from Thabit, from Entropy, from your family, your team? in the coming year like uh, coming, pan, pan, pandemic aside all of this let's just pretend that that shit it'll, it'll pass not even, not even it's part of life today so yes. it's part of gonna happen it's part of us saying remember when coronavirus when covid19 was a thing yes okay so i'll i'll start by repeating uh something that i heard on on a podcast that i was listening to so like uh, if um, i don't know i i don't uh, i don't um, 
I don't want to put out this kind of news as often as I probably should. Um, but my current training regimen is actually on my balcony. So we have two balconies over here. One has furniture and one has me training. Nice. I come up with my, with my jump rope, uh, which I'm practicing to be like pretty good at. Thanks to my uh, brother Khaled Skanda. Shout out to him. <laughs> I know him. <laughs> And uh, it's, uh, that's another humbling experience for me, learning how to do things properly in a different uh, area. Amazing. Uh, so I, got, I go out there and I do my trainings and uh, I put one of these ear pods in my ears because the other one is like messed up from cauliflower and it doesn't hold anything as well. Oh, okay. So I put one ear pod in and I do my, I do my training uh, out on the balcony, get some sun, get some fresh air. And uh, I listen to a podcast or you know, motivational video, like something every single day. One of the... One of the topics that uh, one of the things that are really really uh, stuck with me is the fact that motivation um, is like showering. Mm -hmm. I, I talked about this in one of my posts uh, earlier. Like, if you want to be motivated that day, you know, then go get your source of motivation wherever you get it from, whether it's right. from a person, from a podcast, from reading a book, from talking to your uh, to a friend, a family, like anything. Yes, and it's the same way. Like, if you want to be clean that day, don't you shower? Yeah, mm -hmm. you probably should. In my mind, I'm like, I need to shower, which means I need to motivate myself one way or another. So I put that ear pod in. That's why I'm listening to that stuff while I train. I don't listen to music. My music's in my head. Right? I already have the focus music that's in my head. I'm going someplace and music's not going to take me there. Right? Love Other it. things are. I put, uh, I put that influence in my, in my ear and I start doing my training. And one of the things that I heard and really, really stuck with me is, hey, man, this is COVID-19. It's not COVID-20. So this came up last year. Mm. It's not going to stay this entire year. It doesn't have to be your reality uh, for this year or for the coming years. So you brace yourself for what's coming. And what's coming is much, much greater than uh, what's past. What you can expect from, from me, from the team, from Entropy in the next, uh, in the next year is you know, so, so much more. Like I had huge, I, I have huge targets and goals and dreams for the academy or what it's going to become but first uh we have to populate it so in one year you're going to see you know uh, you're going to see double if not more the amount of people that come to train and you're going no to see world, you're going to see world champions come out of that academy you know next no year doubt. as soon as the season opens up we will be uh registered to compete in mm -hmm. the UAE tournaments uh, okay. We are already registered to compete in IBJJF tournaments. So any of my students are going to go out there and compete. And some of them were going to compete in the Worlds this year had it not mm -hmm. been canceled. Mm -hmm. uh, so in a year, I hope to have multiple uh, world champions. That's like a, a quest of mine personally. Uh, something that I want certain people to have. And when I say certain people, I don't mean that I don't want it for everybody. I want it for everybody that wants it for themselves. Right? If I can want the world for you, but if you don't have that, you know, it's not going to happen. With, yeah, it's not going to happen. I, there's a famous saying that we say in uh, that we say you can bring the horse to the water, but you can't make him drink. Mm -hmm. I can, can give you everything in the universe, but if you don't have that that drive, the to inner get desire, that, you know, the inner desire, then you know uh, it's it just won't be enough for me to push you there. One hundred percent. So that's what I want to have. I want to impact the most amount of people I possibly can, mm -hmm. and you know, I want to I want to see that team and family grow. That's that's just one of the criteria that I have. Uh, for myself and it's more of a want than yes. it is a must it's a beautiful one to have and Thabit clearly you're the man with the plan to do it and I can't wait I, I, I want to see more of you I want to see more of you on the media side I want to see more of you on the jiu-jitsu side I want to see more of your team I can't wait everybody should be behind what you're doing because a win for entropy and what you're doing is a win for the entire jiu-jitsu community just like a win for any team in the country in the region is a win for all of us and I, I can't wait to see the future is endless the sky's the limit for you i will be forever a supporter after this podcast especially man i just i got to see a side of you and understand what drives you and your team it's beautiful no no flattery involved no no none of this it's really heart to heart jujitsu person to jujitsu person i appreciate what you do and thank you for the message that you're putting out we need more of that and i hope everybody can can get something out of this podcast so thank you so much for doing this brother thank you so much man i truly appreciate it it feels like uh you know, they say time flies when you're, when you're having a good time, when you're having fun. It truly feels like we've been talking for five minutes. And, you know, I, I don't even know. I'm not even looking at the clock. And, you know, I just feel like if, we, if we're here all night, yes. we, we, we'll be chatting. So, um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm pleased and honored and privileged that, you know, I'm here 
to share this time with you and with everybody uh, that's listening. And uh, you know, I only hope and pray for uh, more of these good times to come. There will be many. There will be many. And just like you said, COVID-19, not 20. We got hope. <laughs> we got hope. 20's got a couple of months in it. But Absolutely. Man, listen, honestly, and, and for everybody to know, we were talking about this a little bit before the podcast started, is uh, me and Thabit, just by coincidence, we didn't even know this, we come from the same village in the same country as, as we originate. <laughs> and it's just, it, it makes me so happy, man. Anything is possible. It, wherever background you come from, whatever you, whatever adversity you face, you can become such a great version. And it makes me so proud to see somebody who comes from where I come from succeed in that way. And that's what I mean about the philosophy, like the Middle East, somebody who comes from where you come from, doing this and seeing what's possible when you put your mind to it. So Habibi, it's been an absolute man. pleasure. Thank you so much, man. Anything is possible. It started, it started with somebody with me hearing it somewhere. It's possible. Yes. You don't have to, you don't have to like start by dreaming huge dreams. Okay? You can just say that, Hey, it's possible. That's it. Absolutely. That's all way back when, Absolutely, um, man. you know, uh, thanks for everybody who, uh, who tuned in like i really appreciate it and if you know zaid if you have any uh if you have anything else you want to talk about man like i'm i'm, I'm here i'm not going anywhere Bro, we're, have questions. We're, we're gonna I'm be good. doing this again 100 percent. like it's been no, so I'm like good. some some people you just you you see what i mean like i told you on messages i i knew this i i if there's something i think is a skill that i've developed over time which is knowing when i will connect well with a person or not I feel like I got a sense for that. And just by watching your social media and that few messages, I, I knew we're good. So we're definitely going to be doing this again. I'm excited for so much more podcasts. I want to see your team win a world championship. And I want to have you back on the podcast to, to understand how you guys did it. We're going to get there, inshallah. I hope for it. Amazing. I can't wait. Habibi, thank you so much for doing this. YouTube, thank you everybody for watching. There was a lot of action, a lot of love and support in the chat. I see you. I'm sorry I couldn't get to all of the chats and comments, but I see you guys. Grady, Faisal, Majid, everybody. Thank you so much. Much love, guys. Signing off of YouTube.